Chapter 1 Dad, can we please go home now? I ask. Dad lets out his infamous, agonizingly goofy laugh that seems to shake the whole minivan from the driver's seat. Ugh. Even though I can't see it from the back seat, I know his little pot belly is jiggling like a boat of jelly trying to capsize itself. Honey, he says, we just got here. You haven't seen a single thing that this wonderful park has to offer, and it's got some real doozies, I'll tell you that. Yep, only Dad would use the phrase as horrifyingly cheesy as real doozies. Yeah, Sandy. Mom gives me a stern look in the rearview mirror from the passenger seat. Give it at least a little bit of a chance. I slump back into my own seat. Oh, all right. But I have to admit, so far I've seen nothing but boring stretches of pine trees and sheets of red rock whisk past the minivan's windows ever since we landed in Denver, rented this lame-o minivan, and drove all the way out here to Grover Canyon State Park. Yeah, it's been shaping up to be a real thrilling annual summer vacation with the old rents, all right, as usual. My brother Pete is even less riveted than I am. Just a year younger than me at twelve, he's been passed out most of the car ride, his scrawny figure curled up against his side of the back seat, his trusty light blue backpack on his lap. Dad turns the minivan on to another street, jarring my attention away from Pete. This road's framed on both sides by a series of small, one-story log cabins that are actually kind of cute. As soon as Dad makes the turn, I catch a glimpse of his and Mom's eyes growing misty in the rearview mirror. You guys been here before? We certainly have, honey, Dad says. Though a long time ago, before you and Pete were born, right, dear? Yep, Mom says. A whole lifetime ago. Dad chuckles. No doubt affecting the jelly again. You could say that again, honey, but please don't since we heard you the first time. Ugh, seriously, do they have to be such lame Ugh, seriously, did he have to be such a lame Still, it's weird he and Mom didn't mention that little fact to Pete and me before, not a single time while planning this whole trip. Dad pulls the minivan into one of the cabin's short, dirt driveways and kills the engine. Well, that ought to do it. Don't you dare turn the car back on, I say as he twists the key in the ignition, wraps his arm around the back of Mom's seat, and gazes behind him as if he's going to back the car out of the driveway and then pull out of the park all the way back to the airport. He really sells it, even easing the minivan back a bit. Finally, he grins his notorious goofy grin which I immediately want to slap off his face. Just joking. Yeah, no kidding. I make sure to keep my own face as rigid as all the red rock we've seen so far. Somehow, a hint of a smile hovers on Mom's lips, as usual. To this day, I'm still not totally sure if she actually finds Dad's painfully cheesy jokes funny, or if she just smiles to humor him, or maybe even out of pity. Dad kills the engine for good, and we all climb out of the car, including Pete, who has finally woken up. The intense mid-afternoon Colorado heat beats down on me, but I'm used to it, what with growing up in Florida and all. Speaking of heat, the sun glares off Dad's super bright pink and yellow Hawaiian-style t-shirt. Not sure why he feels like he's in Hawaii, but... Hey, Dad, I say. The loud and obnoxious shirt company called and... Let me guess, he says. They want my shirt back? No, they want to buy the rights to yours so they can sell it on the front page of their latest magazine, loud and obnoxious shirts for the world's biggest dorks, and make an absolute fortune. Dad grins as he stretches his back. Good one, Sandy. Pete grins too, though it's clearly his I don't really want to but I can't help it grin. Mom's hint of a smile grows a little more also. As we all stretch a bit and Pete lets loose a huge yawn, I check out the area. Most of the other cabins sport empty driveways, though a car or pickup truck sits in a few. What sounds like twangy country music drifts from somewhere a bit further down the block. Ugh, hopefully that won't be going on the whole time we're here. Then we all head to our own cabin, the kind where you can see all the individual logs it's made of stacked on top of each other, like every cabin on the block. 
but we have to wait for Dad to unlock it with the key he got from the National Park Service office at the park entrance. What little excitement I actually had dies as soon as we go inside, though. Not surprisingly, it's pretty cramped since it's only got a couple of tiny bedrooms, one of which Pete and I have to share. Plus there's a half living room, half kitchen that doesn't even have a TV. Throw in a bathroom fit for an elf, and that's pretty much all the cabin's got. Well, aside from an all-consuming musty stench. Well, I say, if you need me, I'll be hanging from the only fan in the cabin. I point at the tiny, pitiful-looking thing on the ceiling in the living room slash kitchen. Just looking at it makes you think it'd just eye you grudgingly if you flipped its switch. Very funny. Dad flips both the fan and light switches, and the fan slowly lumbers into action, eventually spinning at a meager speed. Not exactly helpful for the unbearable Colorado heat, and unfortunately Mom and Dad reserved a few nights in this godforsaken heat trap of a place. Now what are we supposed to do, I ask? Watch the fan creak and groan for a few hours? Is that the main source of entertainment around here? Seriously, I can think of a trillion things I'd rather be doing right now, like watching romantic comedies and talking about cute boys with my friends back in Florida or even doodling on my sketch pad. Come to think of it, I should have brought that thing. Well, aren't you the negative one today, Dad says. More like every day, Pete mumbles. He's already on the puny sofa with a way too colorful comic book fanned open in his lap, his infamous backpack sitting on the cushion beside him. Seriously, the kid never leaves home without that thing. I'll tell you what, Dad says. Why don't you two go exploring a bit while your mother and I unpack the car and get settled in? This is a pretty terrific park, you know. Oh, I'm sure it's very terrific, Dad. You see, what makes it so special is it has several canyons, and these canyons have very extraordinary things called emerald veins running along their bottoms. He then, unbelievably enough, holds up both his hands and ripples his fingers as he croons. Ooh... I quirk an eyebrow at him. Dad, for the love of God, stop. And emerald veins? What the heck are those? He chuckles, though thankfully ceases the crooning and finger rippling. Well, you see, there are large emerald deposits under the bottoms of most of the canyons, and over the course of time, some of the canyon surfaces have cracked a bit from the dry heat. The result is a kind of funky series of what look like narrow, emerald-colored channels running along the bottoms, or emerald veins, if you will. The only funny-looking thing around here is you, I say. Seriously, it's really quite neat, right, honey? He asks Mom, who at least has the decency to be wearing her typical gray business suit. Sure, it's vacation, but I've always admired her hardcoreness and seriousness. She jerks her head away from where she'd been looking out of the small square of a window, making her long black hair swish through the air. Her gorgeous hazel eyes don't shimmer like they usually do as she says, Oh yeah, sure. Every time I lay my gaze on her, I can't help but to think how amazingly beautiful she is, and that's saying a lot since she got an extremely rare form of skin cancer when she was only my age, and 80% of her skin got all black and crusty, including on her face. Thankfully, that's all cleared up, and there's been no sign of the cancer for many years now. Still, that was weird. Looked like she'd been floating off in La La Land or something there for a minute. What the heck was she just thinking about? And why doesn't she seem overly enthused about the emerald veins when she's clearly been so pumped for this vacation ever since she and Dad started planning it? I'm about to ask when Dad says to me, So, why don't you and Pete get going? There's a canyon with some of those marvelous emerald veins right near this cabin development, and it's one of the big ones. You just keep going down the main road, the one we were on right before we turned into this one, and you'll hit it in no time. You can easily walk there from here. I continue to stare at him with my red rock face, not sure what Pete's doing, though, probably reading his stupid comic book again. Oh, all right, I finally say. I guess it beats being trapped in this sweatshop of a cabin... Let's go, Pete. That's the spirit, Dad says. Oh, and be sure to take a couple of waters with you, Mom says. You can get dangerously dehydrated out here without even realizing it, because the dry heat sucks the sweat right off you. It's always good to have a water bottle on hand. Okay, good call. 
I'll be sure to grab a couple from the minivan on our way to the canyon. Let's go pop the trunk, honey, Dad says to Mom. You know, open sesame if you catch my drift. He winks at her and that ghost of a smile appears on her face again. Yes, dear, she says. Open sesame. You guys are such dorks, I say. Well, Dad, really. But I can't help but notice there seems to be an extra meaning behind the glances they just exchanged. A very small, special, extra meaning. But it vanishes as quickly as it appears. Hmm. Odd. Pete puts down his comic book and we all leave the cabin. Dad pops the trunk on the way to the minivan and I fish out two unopened water bottles from a case in the back. Oh, Dad, I say as he and Mom start pulling the suitcase out of the trunk. Your fly's open. Again? He asks with that same horrendous goofy grin as he bends down to fix it. I was totally lying, of course. I roll my eyes as I turn around and keep heading down the dirt driveway with Pete, but not before I notice a smile has faded from Dad's face when he realizes his fly is completely fine. Chapter 2 You excited for the emerald veins? I ask Pete as we head down the paved street lined with cabins toward the main one. He adjusts his large, clunky glasses as he grinds his teeth a bit an ancient habit of his. Not really. I know, seriously, who could possibly be excited about emerald deposits underneath the bottom of a canyon? Even Mom didn't seem to care. Yeah, I noticed. I have to admit, hardly anything gets by Pete. To be honest, I'm surprised this whole trip was her idea, or at least the Grover Canyon State Park part. The next leg of our trip is three nights in a small town called Telluride in southwest Colorado, another painfully long drive from here, filled with more red rock and pine trees galore. At least that's what Mom and Dad said. Me too, Pete says, though she does seem to be preoccupied with something. Not sure what, though. Yeah, I noticed that too. Even a couple of weeks before the trip, she'd seemed to be constantly alternating between being spacey and literally vibrating with intense energy, two totally different extremes, but I just figured she was excited for the vacation. Pete scuffs his foot against a large stone in the middle of the road as we continue along. But enough about Mom. Why are you always ragging on Dad so much? I mean, I know you normally do at home, but it seems to be like on overdrive or something since we've been on vacation. Hmm. He has a point. I shrug. He's just a lame-o, that's all. He's not cool like Mom. Seriously, there's absolutely no comparison in my opinion. I mean, Mom's the head of a gigantic, highly respected pharmaceutical company that creates all these major award-winning products that help millions of people's health issues. It's why we have such a big, fancy house and go on so many expensive vacations. On the other hand, Dad works for a tiny company that makes a bunch of silly, cheap comic books that really have a dumb sense of humor, if you can even call it humor. What are you talking about? Pete asks. Dad's hilarious, and his company's comic books are pretty funny too, and smart because they always star superheroes who solve problems and defeat villains and stuff with their huge, sciency brains. But, well, you know what if you actually read any of them? I have read some of them. Not really. I'd never touch one of those pathetic things in my life. They're just... not my thing, that's all. Pete scoffs, though on him it sounds more like a light cough. Says the girl with a ginormous sense of humor who's always reading science and math books in her free time. All right, he's got another point there, although the books always annoy the crud out of me because I have trouble grasping what they're saying exactly, but I'd never admit that to Pete especially since he's so naturally good at both those things. Lucky guy. We turn the corner and continue along the much wider main road, like Dad said, a lone cabin bordering it on the right. A man standing at a grill at the cabin's property, nearly at the edge of the street. He's got to be over six feet tall and wearing a pair of ripped dark blue jeans and a black t-shirt so tight I can see he's pretty muscular. But the weirdest feature of all is his long, gray, wispy hair falling along the sides of his super pale face and past his shoulders. He stares at Pete and me, totally expressionless. I can't help but gaze back, and a smile slowly breaks out on his face, one that doesn't quite reach his eyes and reveals a couple rows of yellow, crooked teeth. I stifle a cringe as quickly as I look away, but I can't help but glance at him a couple more times as we walk by, and each time he's still staring at us 
hard. During my last glance, he's even in the middle of flipping a burger on the grill, which he does deftly without even looking at it, a light steam drifting up into the partly cloudy sky. This time, I can't help but shiver, only to notice a woman a little further along the road, also on the cabin's property. She's back a ways, though, just outside the cabin. She looks pretty young and is wearing what appears to be a white Victorian dress, complete with bonnet, holding a baby and a blanket in her arms. When her gaze falls upon Pete and me, and her eyes widen slightly and she takes a step back, clutching her baby even closer to her chest as if we pose some kind of crazy threat to it or her family or something. Oh man, I whisper just loud enough for Pete to hear once we pass the couple. Those people are weird and kind of creepy. Tell me about it, he whispers back. Hopefully not everyone staying out here is like that. Amen. We round another corner, and I don't even bother to look back at the couple before we do. The way my back is prickling, I just know they're both still staring intently at us, so I focus on what's ahead. Looks like the road continues for a little ways before making yet another turn. Hopefully the canyon is just around that one, because it already feels like we've been walking for an eternity. Or maybe that's only because of the creepy people we just passed. Hey, check it out! Pete points off to the side of the road. What? I don't see anything. He heads to the other side and points again. Ah, what appears to be a dirt path of some kind weaves through the woods a little ways before disappearing into the thick of it. It's so narrow and overgrown, I'm surprised Pete even saw it. I mentally slapped myself in the face. Of course he did. He's the noticer of everything, after all. Cool, I say. So you found an old, crummy, overgrown path. Big deal. He shrugs. Yeah, I guess you're right. I'm about to keep walking down the main drag when an idea hits me. Let's see where it goes. Pete looks at me as if I've sprouted my own cluster of weeds and undergrowth which would actually be kind of cool, especially if they pushed up from my hair alongside my sandy-colored pigtails. Then I could be some kind of super vegetation woman like Poison Ivy or something, fighting crime with a bunch of twisted vines and flower buds. Not that I give a crud about comic book characters, of course. Pete cocks his head and runs a hand along his smooth black hair as he examines the path. He's so lucky. He got Mom's beautiful thick hair and shimmering hazel eyes while I got super thin hair and poop-colored eyes from Dad, of course. Really? he asks. You want to explore the sorry thing? What if it doesn't go anywhere, or at least anywhere interesting? And what if it sort of just disappears and we get lost? We won't get lost. If it disappears, we'll just head back. Plus, wherever it goes, it's got to be more interesting than emerald veins. I hold up my open hand and ripple my fingers like Dad did as I croon, Ooh. He chuckles, wiping a stray strand of his wavy hair away from his eyes. Come on, I say. If we don't check it out, we'll never find out one way or another, right? Plus, we have a few nights here. Something tells me we're going to be seeing more than our fair share of emerald veins during all that time. This is our chance to see something different. Not that I'd bet on it, but I'd rather find out for sure. Pete keeps gazing down the trail and finally nods. Okay, let's go. At least for a little while, anyway. That's the spirit, I say, trying to emulate Dad's overly dorky voice. Yeah, that's a great idea, says a deep voice with an oddly feminine twang to it. We both whip around. That same creepy man with the long, wispy hair by the grill is walking along the road holding the leash of a ferocious-looking Doberman pincher. The sleek black dog stares at us with unblinking eyes. What the? Wasn't this guy just grilling hamburgers? And where the heck did the dog come from? Either way, the man's still wearing that awful smile, the one that doesn't quite reach his eyes and reveals his grotesque teeth. You kids go on ahead and do that. His smile widens ever so slightly as he and his dog pass us. Just don't get lost now. Pete and I don't even say anything, just push onto the trail, our feet sinking into the soft earth, and keep going. I don't even bother to give the eerie man another glance. I know he and his dog are watching us, maybe even standing in place now. I can only hope they don't wind up following us. Chapter 3 Pete and I headed along the overgrown trail for a while. 
Thankfully, it's not too hard to make out since whenever it looks like it's finally going to peter out into nothing, it widens a bit, or winds through an area with less undergrowth so it's easy enough to discern. The minty scent of pine needles is overwhelming out here, and they constantly brush against our clothes and bare skin whenever we push between trees closely packed together. They always create a sharp, itchy sensation on my flesh. Yeah, this was a great idea, Pete mutters as he scratches his elbow for the millionth time after we push through another clot of bushes. Oh, knock it off, you big baby. Though, I honestly kind of wonder if he's right to be sarcastic. So far, this trail is more annoying than exciting. I also can't help but notice the hoots and gibbers of who knows what types of woodland creatures exactly are lessening as we go, which is kind of weird since we're going farther into the forest, away from human civilization. If anything, you'd think the animal calls and noises would be getting louder and more frequent. I mention that strange fact to Pete. He shrugs. Yeah, I don't know. Words of wisdom from my younger brother. The sky keeps getting cloudier, too, dimming the forest more and more. Although we're still able to keep track of the trail, and I know it's not supposed to rain, at least according to the forecast, I can't double-check on my phone now or see if the forecast's changed, though, as there's no signal or internet access out here. Another wonderful trait of good old Grover Canyon State Park, which means that, over the next few days, I can't even text any of my friends about all the very terrific times my family and I will be having. I mentioned that annoying fact to Pete, too. Well, at least you have a bunch of friends to text if you could. I mean, who would I text? Marley? Well, yeah... Marley a super shy and nice kid who's always wearing t-shirts and sweatshirts that are way too big for him is Pete's only friend. I know Pete appreciates him, though. At least Dad's always there for us, Pete says as though transitioning back to the middle of the conversation we were having earlier, stepping over an especially mossy log lying in the middle of the path as he does. What do you mean? I step over the log, too. You know, he's always home in the evenings and around on weekends. Mom's always working, like, non-stop. He's not exactly lying about that. Neither of us are all that close to Mom, really. But when she's doing such amazing, important work for the betterment of all mankind, and everyone in the world knows and really appreciates and respects that, you can't blame her for missing out on a little quality time with her kids, right? I mentioned that to Pete. I don't know. I think she's kind of selfish, or maybe addicted. Either way, it's sad, and I honestly don't think it's right. Of course you don't, Pete. You love Dad and his dumb comic books. But I don't say that. I don't want to get into an argument with Pete. As much as I give the little guy a hard time sometimes, I really do love him. Plus, he's as tough and wily as a human-sized crab to be in a debate. Still, I can't help to think back to career day at school when lots of parents came and talked to the class about what they did for a living. Mom was one of them and was clearly the rock star of the bunch. She's so famous and is in loads of primetime commercials for her incredible pharmaceutical company, PharmCorp. Everybody in my class already knew of her and was so impressed with her presentation, they kept asking me questions about her for weeks afterwards. Kids still sometimes randomly come up to me and ask me stuff about her. I let out a light sigh as I remember how she stood in front of the class during that legendary presentation with her sharp, perfect-fitting business suit on her tall, slender figure. So remember, everyone, when you're old enough to have wrinkles, give Paxidermic 56 a try. It'll lend moisture and essential vitamins to your skin, softening it up considerably and straightening out some of those pesky wrinkles. I know it's a very long way off before any of you will need Paxidermic 56, but whatever you do, don't forget about it. I promise me you'll be so glad you did. That's Paxidermic 56, everyone. And that's mom, always selling, always promoting her company and all its amazing products regardless of who she's talking to. She really is incredible. Come to think of it, she'd already invented Paxidermic 56 when she beat cancer at 13 years old. I bet she would have used it to help clear up her black, crusty skin. Suddenly the trail ends and Pete and I slip between another pair of closely wedged together pine trees, which irritatingly scratch my bare arms and legs. We step out along the rim of a canyon and just gaze down at it. It's actually pretty nice as canyons go. A good size, maybe a mile across, a quarter of one deep if I'd a guess, the forest surrounding it on all sides. Huh, and wouldn't you know it, 
A series of narrow, emerald-colored cracks run along the bottom, some pretty straight, others weaving wildly while connecting with and splitting off of others. But there's something else, too. Smack dab in the middle of the canyon. I squint hard, but I can't really tell what it is. It just looks like a tiny gray square from up here. I point it out to Pete. What do you think it is? Dunno, but I hate to break it to you, Sandy. This trail doesn't exactly lead to anything more interesting than what we're probably going to see a trillion times with Mom and Dad. Just another canyon with those emerald vein things in it. I let out a longer, wearier sigh than before. Yeah, I guess you're right. Oh well. I'm about to turn around and head back when another idea hits me. Hold on, why don't we go down and check that gray thing out? He gives me that overgrowth sprouting from my hair look again. Is it weird that I feel like some kind of superhero woman whenever he does that? Really? You're kidding, right? I mean, that thing looks more boring than Dad's Saturday morning socks after he's neatly folded them in his dresser drawer. I chuckle. Hey, that was actually kind of funny. He beams as if I just gave him the biggest compliment in the history of mankind. But not that funny, I say. The smile drops off his face and his scrawny shoulders droop. I'm just kidding. Come on, let's do it. It won't take that long, and who knows, maybe we just discovered something like the emerald veins that we'll become famous for, except this will be called the tiny gray boring thing that nobody gives two cruds about. I didn't mention the fact that it's extremely unlikely since this old trail clearly leads here, so obviously people have been here before, but I'm glad it brings a smile back to Pete's face. I like it when it's there. He gazes down at the canyon, then back at the woods where the somewhat distant bark of what sounds like the Doberman suddenly wafts from. At least, I hope it's somewhat distant. Either way, my spine stiffens and Pete's eyes go mostly white. Okay, let's do it, he says, and we start trekking down the side of the canyon. Chapter 4 Turns out there's another trail that zigzags down the side of the canyon. And like the one we followed to get here, it's extremely worn and even flat out fades away completely in some places. But it's easy enough to guess where it's going when it does, and we make it to the bottom in no time. Then we head toward the gray square in the middle. Along the way we stop at an emerald vein or two winding along the ground. They're all so tiny I can't even stick a part of my shoe into them. And when we hunch down, we can't actually see any emeralds or emerald deposits below the surface like Dad said. They must be too far down and the channel's too dark and narrow. All we see is a tiny hint of green far below. These are why Mom wanted to come here? I ask as I squint down another boring vein as we continue along. Yeah, beats me too. Maybe they're bigger and brighter in other canyons or something. I sure hope so, or else Mom might be starting to lose her sanity or coolness. Pete rolls his eyes. Yeah, I bet it's one of those. Finally, we make it to the gray square, which looks to have a width of about six or seven feet in the middle of the canyon. Well, Pete says, you're right about one thing. It looks to be a tiny, gray, boring thing nobody gives two creds about. Seriously. I step on the square, bend down, and place my palm against its smooth, firm surface. Yeesh. I immediately yank my hand away. It's insanely hot in the sun, too. Concrete and it looks like it used to be totally covered with red dirt so you couldn't see it at all, but most of the dirt's eroded away. I was just thinking the same thing. Of course he was. So what do you think it's for, I ask? I mean, what do you think it actually is? Pete adjusts his glasses as he grinds his teeth, even slightly barring them this time, which means he's really thinking intently. It always makes him look a bit like a wild animal. I hold back a laugh as I open my water bottle and take a sip. Well, I say, I have no clue what it is, but it'd be kind of cool if it was like the top of some underground building or something. You know, like a huge one some scientist built to study the emerald deposits under the canyon or something. Pete's eyes sparkle as he looks up from the square. Heh, <laughs> that's such a cool idea. You have such a great imagination, Sandy. Huh, <laughs> yeah, right. Although, I say... The fact the square looks like it used to be covered in dirt almost makes it seem like it's a secret building. You know, like maybe built by a top-secret government agency or something to do or study something they didn't want the public to know anything about. I mean, we are out in the middle of absolute godforsaken nowhere here. 
Pete's eyes widen slightly, his glasses making them appear even bigger than they actually are. Now that would be kinda creepy. His hands tremble a bit as he shoves them into his pockets, a telltale sign that he's a little scared. Aw oh man, I got the poor little guy a bit worked up. I didn't mean to do that. I grab for something kind of ridiculous, silly even. Yeah, I say. Some huge, top-secret building where all you have to do is say something incredibly dumb, like Open Sesame, and the square thing slides right open so you can go inside. Open Sesame! I yell in my best impression of Dad's cheesy voice. Suddenly, the ground starts to move, super fast, only it's going up. Pete immediately jumps off the square. I cry out and stumble off the side, landing hard on my butt in the red dirt, my back slamming against the ground next. Pain stabs through me, but I barely notice, keeping my gaze glued to the concrete square as it continues to rise, higher and higher eventually revealing what looks like a pair of metal elevator doors. Then it stops. What in the... A short silence rolls through the middle of the canyon. All I can do is stare at the doors. They slide open with a light squeal, what looks like a cloud of dust puffing out of the hollow interior which is all shiny metal. Well, it definitely looks like an elevator. I glance at Pete, who's standing a couple of feet away, his gaze also glued to the doors. His whole body's trembling like crazy now, his hands still in his pockets. He glances down at me, and I know exactly what he's thinking. What in the history of Grover Canyon State Park? No, all of Colorado, or even the entire world, just happened. Chapter 5 Pete and I look back at the elevator. Can you believe it? He asks. It's an elevator. My lips barely move. I can see that. Unless it's really some kind of crazy desert mirage, like from some of the old western movies Pete and I watched growing up. But it can't be a mirage. I mean, I felt that thing move. Heck, it even lifted me a couple feet into the air before I stumbled off it. Pinch me, Pete says. I reach out to his bare leg and give his flesh a good hard twist. He yanks his leg away. Ow! I didn't mean really. Well, next time, be more descriptive. Sandy, what the heck is going on? What do we do? I slowly climb to my feet and dust the red dirt off my butt and what I can off the back of my shirt. What kind of silly question is that? We go inside the elevator, of course. What? Are you insane? You want to go inside that thing? We don't even know where it leads or even if it's safe in the first place. Pete, look at it. It looks pretty darn advanced and it clearly goes somewhere. This is the exciting thing we've been looking for this whole time. Yeah, the exciting thing you've been looking for this whole time. But he removes his hands from his pockets and rests his arms along his sides. Come on, what's the big deal? We go down, we come back up, we'll be back in time for dinner. Well, we've still got a few hours before that, but I figure it gets the point across. He doesn't answer, though. Instead, his eyes lose their focus, and he starts teetering on his toes from side to side a bit. Pete, come on, stay with me, buddy. I head toward the elevator and step inside. It's nice and cool in here, and bright thanks to a glaring bulb overhead. All four walls in the floor are shiny metal, and I can see myself five times over. I smirk. There's room for one more. Pete continues to gaze at me and the elevator with unfocused eyes, his mouth slightly open like he still can't believe this is all happening. I have to admit I'm partly there too, but I'm also extremely thankful. I mean, what are the odds of something fun and interesting actually happening today? Or any day of our whole family vacation for that matter? Finally, Pete steps forward and joins me in the elevator. Going down, I ask, still smirking. To his credit, he doesn't even crack a grin, just looks straight ahead out the doors. I push the only button inside the elevator and the doors slide shut, sealing us off from the outside world. Then the tiny cabin hums lightly as it begins to descend, going lower and lower, deeper and deeper underground. Below the emerald deposits, I'm thinking. Chapter 6 The elevator continues to descend, lower and lower. My ears pop a bit and my stomach tilts on its side. Just how far does this thing go, and why so far? Finally, the elevator coasts to a stop, and the doors slide open again. Nothing but pitch blackness gazes back at us. Oh, this is great, Pete mutters. I have to admit it's not very comforting. 
We stand there for a bit, trying to let our eyes adjust to the darkness, but they don't very much. And when they do, there isn't much to see anyway. Just a silver metal floor stretching away from the elevator entrance into the patchy dimness beyond. Nuh-uh, Pete says. No way I'm going in there. He makes to push the elevator button again, probably in hopes it'll bring us back up to the canyon surface, but I playfully slap his hand away. Oh, come on. What's a little adventure, scaredy cat Sue? Who's scaredy cat Sue? He asks in a slightly wobbly voice. Here we go again. I don't know. Just figured it describes you perfectly, and I have to say I think it does. I gingerly step out of the elevator and Pete lets out a small gasp, but there still isn't much to see. Ugh. I run a hand along the smooth metal wall to the side of the elevator. What are you doing? he asks. Looking for a light switch. But there isn't one, so I try the wall on the other side. Aha! There's one here, so I give it a quick flick, and bright light washes the area, causing me to squint. The elevator opens into a large open space full of metal walls, floor, and ceiling. The wall to our left boasts a phrase in huge gold, shiny letters smack dab in the middle of it, Magnum Health Lab SE. I point it out to Pete. Magnum Health? Isn't that Mom's company's biggest competitor? Yeah, I think so. His voice comes out sounding super small, though it might be because he's still in the elevator. And Lab SE, what does that mean? Beats me, but based on how this place looks so far, I think it's some kind of advanced laboratory. Maybe even a top secret one like you suggested, considering it's buried pretty far underground. More good points. Then Pete staggers backwards as he let out a scream that echoes in the whole area. My heart rate spikes, all the hair on my body standing on end. What? What is it? He points to the other side of the room from the gold letters. What looks to be a long metal desk stretches across it, Magnum Health's official logo hanging on the wall behind it. So this must be a reception room of some kind? The logo is made up of two Magnums whose long barrels are crossing each other, a pill for a bullet firing out of each. I'd recognize it anywhere since it's on TV so much. Probably as much as farm cores, but that's definitely not what's got Pete all in a tizzy. Sitting at the only chair behind the desk is clearly a human corpse. It's slumped across the middle of the desktop, the side of its pale, waxen-looking head on top of it, facing our direction so we can see its unblinking, unseeing eyes. It's in such a warped, gruesome state that I can't even tell if it's a man or a woman. Goosebumps thread along every part of my body as shivers continually surge up and down my spine in vigorous bolts. Holy crud! This is the freakiest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. What in the flaming gates of heck is going on down here? Chapter 7 Pete's hyperventilating so much, I think he's going to pass out, even though my own heart rate is now skyrocketing through the ceiling and out of the laboratory, I say, calm down, Pete, just calm down. I know it's super freaky, but it's not going to hurt us. H how do you know? That could be us. A loud thud resounds as he backs into the elevator wall. I don't really have an answer for that. I guess I can't really know for sure, but I settle it for... because it's a corpse. I mean, it's dead. At least, I, I sure hope so anyway, because it'd be seriously freaky if that thing started moving or standing or doing something right about now. But it doesn't as we continue to gaze at it, and Pete's heavy wheezes start to lessen, then disappear completely. Same with mine. All right, good. He puts a hand to his scrawny chest, which is still heaving a bit. Very good. Wait, this isn't good. That's a dead person, Sandy. An actual dead person, sitting at this laboratory's reception desk as if it's just another day at the job. I mean, there's no way that can actually be a good thing, right? I don't answer. Instead, I continue sweeping the area with my gaze, and my gut clenches, my hands growing cold and moist as I wring them. I hate to say it, Pete, but it looks like that guy's got some company. I point to an all-metal corridor that branches off the reception room straight ahead, though it's partly in shadow because the light's not on over there, but enough filters over from this area to make out what appears to be another pale, human-like figure splayed out in the middle of the hallway. Like the corpse at the desk, it doesn't even look to be wearing any clothes. It's just a waxen mass of flesh and bone. 
But that might be because whoever it was died many years ago, and the body's acids eventually ate away all its clothing. At least, I heard somewhere that that's eventually what happens. I think I'm gonna be sick, Pete says. Seriously, I'm gonna puke. Now that he mentions it, a nauseous feeling slithering around my stomach too. I rub my clammy hands against it, trying to coax it to settle down, but it's not really working. I admit, it's not looking good, I say. Something happened down here, Pete. Something bad. Yeah, no kidding, Sherlock. We should leave. Like, right now. I mean, who knows what killed those two people? Or if it killed more? Or if it's still around, whatever it is? I hate to say it, but he's totally right. This is completely and utterly crazy, and horrifying, and potentially extremely dangerous. Yeah, let's go. I flip off the lights, blanketing the room in total blackness again, and go back into the elevator. I push the button with a shaky finger, and the doors slide shut so Pete and I can stare at our sunken eyes and our sunken faces that are ashen as the corpses we just saw. We can't tell Mom and Dad, I say. No, definitely not. I'm glad he agrees, because Mom and Dad would be really angry and we just plain went off the main road. Forget about breaking and entering a top secret lab full of waxy corpses, we just freak them out. We'll tell them we saw the emerald veins, I say, that we went to the canyon they told us to go to in the first place. That's it. Sounds like a good idea to me. The elevator squeals open and the intense Colorado heat smacks into us. I don't think I've ever been so happy to feel it, or any kind of intense heat my entire life. There's still time to check out the other canyon, though, Pete says. I try for a smile. Yeah, I guess that's true. Let's go. We exit the elevator, and as soon we, as we do, the door slides shut and the cabin dips back down into the earth, the gray concrete square settling into the spot it was before. I shiver as I cast one last long look at the square, then Pete and I head back along the canyon bottom and up the zigzagging trail to the rim, silent the whole way. We navigate our way back through the woods, following the worn, overgrown trail we took to get there, still deathly quiet. We have way too much to think about, and two utterly horrifying images we're trying to erase from our memories. At least I definitely am. Finally, we make it to the main road, and I breathe what feels like a deep, inward sigh of relief. Back to our family vacation. Back to a normal life. Pete and I can totally forget what we just saw, pretend it never even happened at all, and as far as we're both concerned, or at least me, there is no old, overgrown trail branching off Grover Canyon State Park's main road. And there definitely isn't a canyon at the other end with a top secret laboratory hidden underneath it. Pete and I continue along the main drag toward the canyon Mom and Dad wanted us to visit in the first place. But as soon as we round the first corner, we stop short. A little ways down the road, maybe a quarter mile or so, a small knot of three police cars is blocking it, their red and blue lights flashing. Huh, that's weird. What's going on over there, I ask? Beats me. Apparently, that's turning into Pete's favorite phrase. But another intense feeling grips me, and it's not just curiosity. Something else is going on in this park, something not good from the looks of it. We should go check it out, I say. See if anything's wrong. Yeah, okay. We continue toward the knot of cop cars. Along the way, we pass a large parking lot on the side of the street with a wide, clearly marked trailhead. A big wooden sign next to it reads, Grover Grand Canyon. That must lead to that other canyon, I say, the one Mom and Dad wanted us to go to. Pete nods, his expression still a bit hollow, probably wishing we'd done that all along like I am. Finally, we make it to the cop cars and a tall, well-built policeman and a shorter, pretty chubby policewoman step out of one. Sorry guys, the man trains his stern gaze on us. You can't go past this point. Oh, I say? How come? The whole area's been cordoned off. No one's allowed to leave or enter. The whole area? I ask. The whole park? The woman says, then takes a bite out of a big white powdered donut she's holding in one hand. I guess it's true what they say about cops. 
Well, some of them anyway. She sees me eyeing the donut and carefully wraps it back in the paper napkin she's holding in her other hand before shoving it all in her pocket. So much for sharing. How come? I ask. Not sure, the man says. We've just been given strict orders not to allow anyone to enter or leave the premises. Oh, well that's definitely weird. And kind of unnerving. What could possibly be going on? Has this ever happened before? Pete asks. Oh, good question. Wish I'd thought of it myself. The woman shakes her head, some white powder still coating her plump lips. Not that I know of. Hmm. Also weird. The man puts a hand to his ear. Roger, just a couple of kids at the moment, sir. He must be using a radio earpiece to talk to someone at headquarters or something. The man's jaw goes slack as his face grows a few shades paler. Huh? What's that, sir? Come again? A long silence. If possible, his face seems to grow pastier, his jaw slacker. But, but they're just kids, sir. Another long silence. Okay, I understand, sir. He removes his hand from his ear, then brings it to the handle of the black pistol sticking out of the holster jutting from his waist. He pulls the gun out of the holster and points it right at me. Chapter 8 I can't move. I can't think. I just stare at the little black hole in the barrel of the pistol, and it stares back. Then, instinct takes over. Pete, run! I dart toward the side of the road and dive into the woods just as the gun goes off, a deafening crack resounding in the area. As soon as I whip past the first line of pine trees, the ground slopes super steeply. I lose balance and scream as I tumble to the ground and start rolling. I keep rolling, maybe three or four times, pain stabbing me in random places. Finally, I come to a stop at the base of a small hill. My whole body screaming now in pure pain and agony, but I wrench myself to my feet anyway just as Pete tumbles to stop beside me. More deafening cracks, from what sounds like two guns this time, ring out as he also yanks himself to his feet. We continue to rush through the trees and undergrowth, further into the forest. I try to ignore the intense pain pounding through me as we do. Finally, the gunshots stop. Don't pass the park boundaries, the policeman's distant-sounding voice yells. Seems like it's still coming from the knot of the police cars. Good. The cops haven't decided to come after us. Or we'll be forced to shoot you. Or they'll be forced to shoot us? Are they crazy? Clearly they don't mind shooting us when we were actually within the park boundaries either. What in the history of the whole freaking universe is going on? Then a realization hits me. The police could have easily just killed Pete and me. I mean, we were literally at point-blank range when that cop pulled his pistol on me. But clearly he didn't want to. Neither of them did, even though they'd obviously been ordered to. I mean, we're just kids, and clearly in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's okay, I say. We can stop. We both hunch over and catch our breaths, trying to settle our nerves. Then we straighten and take stock of ourselves. Thankfully, my pain has died down a ton, and it looks like I've only got a couple of bruises on one of my bare elbows and knees, and probably my shoulders and hips too, since they ache a bit. Pete looks to be in similar shape. We don't have our water bottles anymore, though. Must have lost them in the big tumble down the hill. Not that that's a huge loss at this point, but still. Jeez, Pete says. That was insane. We do our best to brush off some of the dirt off our wounds, which thankfully aren't bleeding. Now that we've stopped and calmed down a bit, I notice the familiar minty scent of pine trees and random calls and sounds of woodland creatures surround us again. Why did they shoot at us, he asks. Why would a couple of policemen shoot at a couple of innocent little kids? The question of the century. Your guess is as good as mine, I say. It doesn't make any sense. I know, but something's obviously going on here, in this park. Something really big and really bad. Pete stops wiping the dirt off his glasses with his shirt and stares hard at me. His normally smooth black hair is sticking out in weird places after his tumble down the hill, making him look like he's gone partly insane. Maybe he has. You don't think it has something to do with the hidden laboratory and the fact that we just broke into it, do you? Huh? What in the flaming heck is he talking about? 
No, no way. The lab's a decent way from here, and we didn't actually do anything there anyway, remember? But even as I say it, I'm not totally sure. Maybe all this does have something to do with the creepy place. I'm not sure how exactly, though. Pete grinds his teeth a bit, then puts his glasses back on. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. He looks up at the sky, which is the cloudiest it's been all day. So what do we do now? The second question of the century. I'm thinking we got to get back to Mom and Dad, I say. Tell them about the fact the park's been cordoned off, if they don't already know, and how the police shot at us even though we were within the border. I mean, hopefully we can even do that. Hopefully the police haven't been ordered, or will be ordered, to actually go inside the park and kill anyone they see on sight or something totally crazy like that. I have to admit, based on what just happened, that definitely seems like a possibility. A concept that makes every part of my body quiver so much I feel like a giant sack of chili. I hope Mom and Dad are okay. Please, God, tell me they're okay. Pete licks his lips, beads of sweat bubbling up along his forehead. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, let's go. I start heading in the direction I'm sure leads back to the cabins, Pete following close behind. But no sooner than we do so, than a whirring noise fills the area. Light at first, but growing louder and louder by the second. What the heck is that, I ask? Pete points up into the gray sky. What the? An all-black helicopter's flying above us what looks to be in the middle of the park, and it's slowly coming towards us. Stick as close as you can to any trees, I say. It'll be harder for whoever's driving that thing to see us, and we don't know what it's up to exactly. Especially since it doesn't look like a police chopper. At least its exterior doesn't say police or anything like that. Not that it might necessarily matter one way or the other at this point. Still, I can't help but wonder who the chopper might belong to. Maybe the government or special forces or something? That would be pretty creepy. I don't bother mentioning that or asking Pete's opinion, though. Don't want to freak him or even myself out more than we already are. Anyway, we both do as I said as we go, sticking close to trees whenever possible and we're in the middle of passing a small clearing as the helicopter eases fairly close, but we make sure to stay just past the clearing's threshold, hopefully out of view of the chopper. Adrenaline churns through my veins and my heart thuds hard in my chest. Please don't see us. Please don't see us. A couple deer, what look to be a mother and her fawn with white dots peppering its brown fur, are in the middle of the clearing. One's just standing there, the other munching on a patch of beautiful purple flowers. It's almost serene, really, and even helps me relax a bit despite the incredibly stressful situation. And then yet another deafening noise rips through the area and keeps going. I shove my hands to my ears as the two deer slam to the ground, a spray of blood flying up around them. The ear-splitting noise stops. The deer don't stir. Holy crud, it shot them! The helicopter! It machine-gunned the two totally innocent, extremely docile deer to death! But why? Why? I instinctually throw my arms around Pete, forcing him to stop moving. Then I jam my head in the crook of his neck and sob loudly. Chapter 9 After a long moment, I pull away from Pete, tears blurring my vision. It's just too much raw emotion. I can't handle it. His eyes are rimmed in red, too. The chopper passes fully above the clearing and is now moving away from us, going in the opposite direction we planned on heading. Good. Thank God. At least for now. Still, there are no words. Simply nothing I can possibly say to describe how what just happened makes me feel. It was just so horrible. So senseless. So unfair. It makes me incredibly sad yet detest life with a burning hatred at the same time that something like that could happen. Come on, I say. Now we really need to get back to Mom and Dad. No argument from Pete, so we continue our trek, putting the clearing and helicopter even further behind us. But we've only been hiking for another minute or so when more whirring noises join the first one. I glance up at the sky. Oh crud, you've got to be kidding me. 
Now there's a whole bunch of all-black helicopters in the sky, circling and coasting around the area. Every once in a while, the unmistakable, chilling sound of machine gun fire resounds too. Oh god, this is horrible. Absolutely horrible. They're killing everything. Every living thing they lay their sights on. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But why? Why are they doing something so unbelievably horrific? And then, something even worse starts to happen. Enormous, deafening, explosion-like noises reverberate across the whole area, followed by gigantic clouds of smoke billowing from different parts of the park. Oh my god, they're blowing it up, I murmur, the words feeling alien and bumpy on my tongue. The black helicopters, or whoever's flying them, they're blowing up the whole stinking park. Chapter 10 Pete doesn't say a word, just keeps following close behind me. Come on, let's go. Now I'm flat out running. We've got to get there, as soon as we can. Pete grunts as he struggles to keep up. He was never really much of an athlete. Not that I am either, but I'm a little older and definitely more athletic than he is. A couple times, I have to slow down to let him catch up, and hold back an annoyed grunt of my own. Come on, Pete, this is no time for dilly-dallying. But I know that's really the last thing he's doing. A moment later, we come across the edge of a cabin property of the creepy couple from earlier. Yes, almost there. Still sticking close to as many trees as possible, we run along the property border. But what's on it makes it feel as though a huge tangle of lively snakes just dropped into my stomach. Oh god, it's literally unspeakable. The eerie, strongly built man with the long gray hair is slumped against his grill by the edge of the main street on the other side of the property, the large red smears of bullets speckling his back which faces us. His face is collapsed on top of the grill, caught in the roaring, now out-of-control blaze that reaches towards the sky, his entire head a black, burnt crisp. And then there's the man's wife, or whatever she is, wearing her white Victorian dress. She's face down on the grassy lawn just outside the cabin, close to where she was the first time Pete and I saw her. Her body's splayed out like the corpse in the laboratory hallway, red smears dotting her back too, staining her white dress. Same with the small lump of a blanket lying next to her. My stomach's a seesaw, nausea grilling it like how the grill is that man's burnt to a crisp head. As creepy as he and his wife were, they didn't deserve this. Not a single bit of it. Just like the deer, they're completely innocent, and maybe even just as docile. And here they are, dead, without a single clue as to what killed them or why, including a tiny, defenseless baby. How could this have happened? How could any of it be possible? Oh God, seriously, please tell me Mom and Dad are okay. Now that I think about it, where's the Doberman Pinscher? I hope it's okay too, wherever it is. My legs are burning now, begging me to stop, but I can't. No way. Pete and I are almost there. Almost to the cabin development amid continuous thunderous explosions and machine gun fire from what sounds like all around us. My legs are burning now, begging me to stop, but I can't. No way. Pete and I are almost there. Almost to the cabin development amid continuous thunderous explosions and machine gun fire from what sounds like all around us. Finally, we make it to the very edge of the development, and I can make out the cabins between little spaces in the last couple of rows in the pine trees in front of us. Yes, finally we're here. And the cabins all look intact too. No bullet holes or flames or massive clouds of smoke. At least that I can see from here. But I've spoken too soon. Just before Pete and I can burst through the final threshold of trees and race towards our family's cabin, what's clearly some kind of bomb drops from the sky from a black chopper hovering right above the clearing and blows up the cabin closest to us. The tiny structure's walls immediately explode, sending flames and splinters of wood everywhere. Black smoke billows up in a thick channel into the sky. Pete and I can even feel the heat from here. We careen to a stop, staying just outside the development as more bombs drop, blowing up more cabins, all from more black choppers that just arrived. No, I cry, no! I can hear Pete screaming too, though I'm not sure what he's saying exactly. And then a bomb lands on top of our family's cabin, and the whole thing explodes like all the others, 
along with the rented minivan in the driveway. It all bursts into nothing but zillions of flaming smithereens that quickly morph into dense pillars of smoke that waft up to the clouded sky. All the support evaporates from my legs. They wobble like crazy and I drop to the soft earth. I can't believe it. It can't be true. It just can't be true. Now I really don't care. I look up to the sky and scream into it as loudly as I can. Chapter 11 I Keep Screaming over and over again, hot tears running down the sides of my face. Pete is, too. I can barely hear him over my own cries of pure anguish. They're dead. They're dead. They're really dead. The words keep running through my mind. They never stop, never leave. And they're roaring, too. As loud and as hot as the fire and explosions all around us. Mom and Dad. They're gone. Forever. How? Why? I must scream for a lifetime. Maybe even more than that. Finally, I stop and look at Pete. It's over. They're dead. They're gone forever. His face is all crumpled up as he looks back, tears streaming down it too. And now we are too, I whisper. There's nothing we can do. There's nowhere we can go. The flames and smoke are everywhere, all around us, and in the distance, too. It's all a matter of time, really, before Pete and I are trapped in this monstrous, fiery wrath like Mom and Dad and every other living thing in this godforsaken park. Mom and Dad. Their faces flash through my mind. Dad's chubby, goofy one and Mom's pretty, serious one. Why did this have to happen? Why? But there's an intensity to Pete's tear-stained look. A kind of resolve, it looks like. I can think of one place we can go, he says. And before I know it, we're heading back through the woods in the direction we came from. The intense heat and stench of smoke hanging thickly in the air, growing denser as we go, clouding the forest, making it hard to breathe and see more than a few feet in front of us. But we push ourselves along. We have to. We have no other choice. Once we pass the creepy couple's property, we head to the edge of the main road, check to make sure no copters are hovering around it, and dart across to the worn, overgrown path from earlier. We follow it all the way to the rim of the canyon, with a gray, concrete square smack dab in the middle of it. We stop at the edge of the forest once again, inspecting the sky to make sure no all-black choppers are scouring the immediate area. All clear. We charge down the side of the canyon, not even bothering to follow the trail that leisurely winds along it. We need to get there as soon as possible, and nothing beats a straight line. We hit the bottom and gun for the middle. I barely even notice the emerald veins weaving along the ground under our feet. Out of the corner of my eye, I witness bright fires and smoke billowing from almost all the parts of the woods surrounding the canyon, as well as the fact that the sky is practically complete pitch black now, congested with what looks like both smoke and black storm clouds. Yeesh. It feels like the end of the world, the end of life itself. No sooner do those dismal thoughts hit me than that familiar, gut-wrenching, whirring noise reaches my ears from somewhere behind us. No. I glance over my shoulder. Sure enough, a black helicopter's coming this way, barely visible against the dark sky. And it's approaching super quickly, too, much faster than how the others were moving this whole time. No, it knows we're here. It's seen us, and now it's coming after us. I keep running as hard as I can, my legs feeling like they've been set to flames just like everything else around us. But I keep going, operating on pure adrenaline at this point. I glance behind us again. The chopper's gaining, like hardcore. It's practically on us. I look ahead again. I can't see the gray square quite yet, but... Open sesame! I scream. Open sesame! Open sesame! Thankfully, the concrete square starts to rise in the near distance, slowly revealing the two metal doors. We're only a few yards away now. A few feet. The doors slide open just as the ear-splitting machine gun firing starts. We rush inside, and I stab the elevator button. Come on, come on, come on, come on. The red dust kicks up a few yards in front of the elevator as bullets slam into it. They keep coming, forming a straight line heading quickly toward the elevator. Come on, come on, come on, come on. 
The metal door starts sliding shut, the bullets still coming. They're nearly here. I scrunch my eyes shut just as the bullets meet pure metal with loud clangs that echo in the tiny chamber. I whip my eyes open. The doors have closed, and the shapes of a few bullets are engraved in them, jutting slightly into the elevator. Yes, we did it. We made it. I want to jump up and down, I want to hug Pete and pump my fists in the air and do the cha-cha or something totally ridiculous, but then I remember where we're going. The elevator hums lightly as it slowly descends, lower and lower. Deeper underground past the emerald deposits and to what might be a super dangerous laboratory where we might not be able to evade our deaths after all. Chapter 12 the sounds of pure mayhem fade as the elevator descends. Pete and I are hunched over again, struggling to catch our breaths and settle down. Finally, we manage to calm a bit, and the elevator coasts to a stop, the doors sliding open. Here we are again, back in the deathly quiet, still illuminated laboratory reception area with all its metal walls, floor, and ceiling. Oh, and a corpse slumped at the desk, and another right down the dark hallway nearby just like how we left it. Guess it's time to check in, I say. I'm not even sure where that came from or how I managed to dredge up even the tiniest smatter of humor. Although, when I think about it, after everything that just happened, I think a part of me needed to say something at least a little silly. Not even a glimmer of a smile from Pete, though. What now? Well, I guess we've got to wait it out, you know. Wait for the police or government or whatever to finish destroying all of Grover Canyon State Park. And then we've got to wait some more until we're sure it's totally safe to come out there for us to leave. But what if it never is? I mean, that chopper saw us go in here. They know we're down here. What if they just camp out up there and wait for us to come out so they can kill us? Or what if they even come in here after us? A cold shiver ripples along my shoulders, freezing them solid. Ugh. This would be one of those times I'm not all too big a fan of Pete's mega-sized brain. Those are some pretty good and disturbing questions, all right. I don't know, Pete. I really don't. Hopefully the authorities, or whatever they are, don't know how to come down here. I mean, we got ridiculously lucky with that stupid password, Open Sesame. Or not, depending on whether us breaking into this laboratory in the first place is somehow tied to the insane shenanigans going on up there. I mean, what were the chances that would actually open the entrance to this freaky place? Yeah, I know. Either way, I don't think we have much of a choice but to wait. Pete glances at the lone button on the side of the elevator wall, then gives a long, heavy sigh. I guess you're right. So how long should we wait, then? I shrug. I'm thinking at least a day. Maybe until we absolutely need food or water or something, just to be completely on the safe side. He nods, his hair somehow looking even spikier and more out of control than before. Ugh, that's gonna stink. Maybe there's some food and water down here we could have. Even lab scientists gotta eat from time to time, right? I give him the most incredulous look I can muster. You wanna eat food in a place where at least a couple corpses, of which we don't know how they died, are lying around? I mean, who's to say it's not something in the food that killed them in the first place? Plus, the corpses look pretty old, too, like at least a few years, so even if there is food down here, it might be way too stale or spoiled by now. Yeah, that might be true. You never know for sure, though. And with that, he leaves the elevator, his little shoes making light clacks on the metal floor. What are you doing? Exploring a bit. What else is there to do? Stay in the elevator and not get killed by whatever murdered those two lab workers. But I don't say that, I have to admit, though as much as a scaredy-cat soup he can be sometimes, he can also be surprisingly brave. As if some of his courage rubbed off on me, I step out of the elevator, following him as he wanders toward the desk in the middle of the reception area. Not exactly the first place I'd like to scout out, what with the corpse and all, but I guess it's not a bad idea. Maybe we can find out more about what happened down here by taking a look at it. I keep my distance as Pete, as though on cue, hunches over the corpse, clearly making sure not to touch it. Well, it's definitely pretty old. At least a few years, like you said. 
and tough to say, but its skin looks even waxier and more melted than a regular corpse would after that amount of time. It's kind of weird, actually. Although I guess it's partly mummified at this point because it's so dry down here. That would explain why it doesn't smell all that bad, too. Just a little musty. Wow, since when did Pete become such an expert on corpses? Well, I guess he is a science guy, and as much as I hate to admit it, he seems to be pretty good at it, unlike me. But like I said, tough to say. He hovers over the corpse for a moment longer, then starts moseying toward the dark hallway. I follow him, still keeping my gaze away from the desk corpse. Aha! He flicks a switch on the wall near the corridor, and a bright light floods the space, casting even more on the other gruesome corpse sprawled on the ground in the middle of it. Great. Can't escape these horrible, putrid things. At least this dead body is a little ways down the hallway. I check out the rest of the corridor. A few regular-looking metal doors, complete with knobs, line both sides, leading down to one at the very end that looks more like an elevator, only it's super wide, taking up the whole end, and the phrase Lab S.E. is written across the middle in large white paint. The much smaller phrase, Security Clearance Level 1, lies below that in yellow paint. I point out the elevator-like door to Pete. That must be the official lab, you know, where they actually studied or tinkered with whatever crazy dangerous substance or virus or whatever they have down here. Because seriously... Given the dead bodies and the fact that this place is buried deep underground, who knows what the scientists had been busy doing. Whatever it was, it couldn't have been harmless, though. That's for sure. And it looks like you might need some kind of special keycard or passcode or something to access it. Though, I don't see a scanner or terminal or anything beside the door. Yeah, looks like it. Pete's whole body is trembling a bit as he drifts to the first door on the left side of the hall. Good for him, still exploring despite being a little freaked out. At least, I hope it's safe to be doing this. The door sports a small label that says, Security. He tries the knob, it twists, and the door opens easily. He peeks inside. Yep, a security room. He lets me take a look next. As expected, it's a small space, the light from the corridor faintly illuminating two rows of monitors on the opposite wall which are all off, totally black. In front of them are a couple of comfortable-looking chairs with corpses sitting in them. The only way I can tell is because of the whites of the tops of their heads poking above the backs of the seats. Nothing to see here, Pete says. I agree, but that terrible, slithery feeling slides underneath my skin again. Man, I murmur. Seriously, what in the flaming heck killed all these people? and clearly when they'd be right in the middle of doing their jobs. This is just getting sicker and sicker. And scarier. I wish I knew, Sandy. I wish I knew. Hmm. I'm starting to wonder if we really should be walking around like this, no matter how bored we might get or how old these corpses might appear. Maybe we should just stay put in the elevator and wait 24 hours. But as frightening and gross as this whole exploring thing is, I can't help but want to continue anyway. Find out what really happened down here. I softly close the door and we head to the next one on the left along the hall. Thankfully, the corpse splayed out on the ground in the middle of the corridor is still a ways ahead. I'm not looking forward to eventually getting close to it, that's for sure. This door's label reads, Dr. Sarah Kahn, Chief Scientist. Ah, I say. Looks like this is the office of the person in charge of this whole freak show. Pete nods as he twists the knob and the door also thankfully opens. As expected, an office about as big as the security room lies inside. It's a ton homier, though, with a large cherry wood desk with a black leather chair behind it against one wall. There's no corpse in the chair, though. In fact, there's not a single corpse in the whole room, the first time we haven't seen one. Oh, thank God. There's also a comfortable-looking brown leather couch shoved against the wall opposite the desk. A small white canvas hangs above it with the cursive phrase, Magnum Health is my solace, painted on it in soothing turquoise. This room is so relaxing, so inviting, so wonderfully death-free and different than the others so far that I can't help but immediately drift inside. And before I know it, I've slumped my poor, aching body on the leather couch. I don't realize how insanely tired I am until just now. Pete plops himself in the leather chair at the desk. 
and then it all comes rushing back to me. In a matter of seconds, everything that happened ever since Pete and I went on our fateful walk this afternoon. Walking by the creepy couple, exploring the overgrown path, the first time we entered the lab, the corpses lying in the pitch dark, the cops trying to shoot us, the all-black helicopters blowing up the whole park, including Mom and Dad's cabin. Mom and Dad. Now they're all I can think about. Their smiling faces, all the holiday and family vacations we spent together, all the home-cooked and take-out meals Pete and I had with Dad since Mom was always still busy at the Farm Corps office. And then, one time with Dad in particular flashes through my mind. One terrible memory I'd always hated, but now hate more than ever. Chapter 13 In my memory, Dad had just gotten home from work and came to my room, where one of my friends, Carla, and I were vegging after a long day of school. My room's so big it has an antechamber of sorts that's got a leather couch, chair, and widescreen TV above one of those fake electric fireplaces. I was sprawled out on the couch, Carla sitting on the chair. Hey, honey, how's it going? Dad asked as he entered the antechamber, that infamous goofy smile framing his chubby face. Ugh, you've got to be kidding me, Dad. Not in front of Carla. He was also huffing a little, his cheeks tinted pink. I muted the TV. Out of breath from climbing the old stairs there, Dad? What? he asked. No, of course not. Right. Hey there, Carla. She smiled at him, the light glinting off her new braces. She hated them with a boiling passion, but everyone seemed to think they were actually kind of cute, including boys, which I have to admit made me kind of jealous. A part of me has always wondered if she knew that all along and just claimed she detested her braces so much. Hi, Mr. Silverman. She straightened up slightly in her chair as she batted her eyelashes at him. She was always doing weird stuff like that around him. It made me kind of nauseous. My gaze roved over one of his notorious Hawaiian shirts he was wearing, this one green and light blue with an actual parrot printed on it right over his little pot belly. Dad, ew. No annoying shirts allowed in my room. He gestured at it. What's so annoying about a toucan? If I can like toucans, and I'm pretty sure you can too, which... When you think about it, means that not just one person can like toucans, but two can. Get it? Two can? Like two can. He threw back his head and let out a loud laugh that severely jiggled his pot belly. Carla laughed too, what sounded a little too girlishly even for her, which is actually saying a lot. That's not all, Mr. Silverman, she said, eyeing me. I'm betting three can like two cans too. Now they were both laughing hardcore. It made me seriously want to vomit. Dad, was there actually a reason you came into my room? Because I highly doubt sharing a super lame parrot joke was it. I thought it was funny, Carla said. Gee, thanks, Carla. And that was when I saw the comic book clutched in Dad's hand. My gut clenched. Oh no. Dad, please. I told you my room is a no-lame comic book zone. That's two strikes today already. One more and you're out. But he waved his hand through the air as though wiping away my comment. Honey, I really think you'd like this one. I couldn't stop thinking of you ever since Dave and I came up with the idea, and now it's finally finished, fresh off the press. Dave was one of Dad's loserish co-workers over at his stupid comic book company, Funny Comics. And if you happen to think spelling comics as comics, C-O-M-I-X, is even remotely clever or humorous, then I'm sorry to say you're just as loserish as they are. Dad held up the book with both hands so I could see the cover. A young girl who looked an awful lot like me, with crud-colored eyes and sandy-colored pigtails, was plastered to it. She was wearing a pair of blue suspenders and chemistry goggles, both way too big for her, and held two beakers with brightly colored fluids in each hand, one green, one purple. The title, The Incredibly Hilarious Adventures of Super Chemical Girl, curled across the top in fancy script. Overall, as much as I hated to admit it, I thought it was kind of cool-looking. I mean seeing someone who looked exactly like me on the cover of a book, and the fact it was clearly a very original superhero. My excitement must have shown because Dad cried as he practically bobbed from one foot to the other. Aha! See? I knew you'd like it! Oh, God. Dad. And it gets even better, you see. This awesome little girl fights crime using chemistry, so you know she's super smart. Instead of using a weapon like a sword or a utility belt or something, she's constantly mixing chemicals that create certain reactions to stall and defeat her foes. Plus, she's pretty funny, if I don't say so myself. 
reminds me a lot of you. You've got to give it a read, honey. It's the very first volume, and I'm personally hoping we make a ton more. He placed the book on the couch beside my sprawled position, and I gave him the most disgusted look I could muster. Yeah, Dad, because I'm constantly mixing chemicals to stall and defeat my foes. You know what I mean, he says. It looks fun, Mr. Silverman, Carla said. What a traitor. Thanks, Carla. Just give it a quick read whenever you get the chance, honey, he says to me. You too, Carla, if you'd like. I mean, it's fun, light. I really think you'd like it. I rolled my eyes despite the fact that I did think it was sort of cool. Okay, sure, Dad. Great, thanks, hon. See you at dinner. You're welcome to join us too, Carla, if you'd like. He winked at her, but not in a creepy way. Thanks, Mr. Silverman, she said as she flipped her long blonde hair. Ugh, really, Carla? Then he finally ducked out of the room, closing the antechamber door behind him. As soon as he did, I popped to my feet and plopped the book into the trash can by the electric fireplace. What? Carla asked. You're not going to read it? Let's put it this way. If this was a real fireplace, I'd be putting it up on high and placing it in that. Oh, that is harsh, Sandy. Something about her slightly red eyes and slack expression made it seem like she actually felt kind of sad for Dad. Whatever. Though, I guess she had a good reason, because a couple of days later, he came to my room again right after work, again slightly out of breath with rosy cheeks. He also sported yet another loud, brightly colored Hawaiian shirt. Seriously, did he think Florida was right off the coast of Hawaii or something? This time, it was just me lounging in front of the TV, detoxing from another long, grueling day of school. Hey, honey, did you get a chance to read Super Chemical Girl yet? Oh, yeah, it was great. I lied. Thanks for letting me read it. Don't get me wrong, I felt bad lying to Dad, but he should know better by now than to shove comic books of all things down my throat. An exceptionally huge, dorky smile consumed his face, the biggest I'd ever seen on him. That is absolutely fantastic, honey. I'm so glad you like it. See, didn't I tell you that you would? Yep, you sure did. Now, do you mind giving it back to me? That one's actually part of the collection we keep at the office, you know, so visitors can check it out and even read some of it if they want. Or if Dave or I just want to admire the succulent fruits of our own hard labor from time to time. He grinned that goofy, boyish grin of his as he winked at me. Oh, um, I glanced at the garbage can by the fireplace. Crud, the cleaning company had been here yesterday. There is no way the comic book was still in the trash. Er, sorry, Dad, I, um, don't have it anymore. I lost it by accident. I'm so sorry. He waved his plump hand through the air as though wiping away my apology. Oh, that's all right, sweetie. We'll just print another one. No skin off old funny comics' as bones. Anyway, what was your favorite part of the story, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, um, crud. What could I say? Hmm, I don't know, actually. There were just so many. His boyish grin grew even bigger. Oh, come on, honey. I'm sure there's at least one scene or thing that really popped out to you. Please, tell me. Every once in a while, you can indulge your dear old father at least a little, you know. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. Um, my thoughts raced. I racked my brain as hard as I could trying to think of something, anything, any way to somehow answer or avoid this horrible question. But I couldn't think of a single thing. Er, I really can't, Dad. I'm sorry. The light faded from his eyes as the grin slid totally off his face. Oh, I see. Um, no worries, honey. And he left the room. Not surprisingly, he never asked me to read another of his company's comic books ever again. Now, back in Sarah Kahn's office, tears start to blur my vision again. I should have read it, I say. I should have read Dad's stupid company's stupid comic book. Pete doesn't answer. He's asleep, still slumped in Dr. Kahn's chair. And to think of the very last memory I have of Dad. Not just because now I'll never have any more, but because of how I made fun of him for having his fly open when he really didn't. How his smile had slid off his face then, just like it did when he realized I'd never read his Super Chemical Girl comic book. He hadn't deserved that. He hadn't deserved any of it. And now, I'll never get to make up for it. Never get to tell him how much I really, truly love and appreciate him. The tears come again, but I'm barely aware of them, because the next thing I know, my eyes roll open. Once the fuzziness clears from my vision, I see Pete still in the chair. Only now he's sitting up straight his gaze glued to the chief scientist's computer screen. I yawn as I rub my eyes. How long was I out? A couple of hours or so. Whoa, really? How long have you been up? 
he smirks. A couple of hours or so. I only slept a few minutes. Right. He had that long beauty sleep in the minivan, and I hacked the computer's password and skimmed most of its database, which includes loads of company and project files. Of course, Pete the techie. I also read lots of emails this Dr. Sarah Kahn woman exchanged with other lab workers, people from the Magnum Health Organization, and even the government. I sit up straight on the sofa myself. Really? What'd you find out? Anything useful? His smirk grows into a full-fledged smile. Well, let's just say I now know exactly why this laboratory was built in the first place, and I have a pretty good idea why all those dead bodies are lying around there, too. Chapter 14 What? I squeal. Why? What's going on? I fight the urge to jump to my feet and rush over to the computer, as if that would achieve anything. Well, it's a bit of a long story. Ugh, great. But basically... I was able to find out this lab was a research facility at first for some kind of microscopic fungus a scientist dude found coating the bottom of the emerald deposits in this particular canyon. You know, the one that makes the emerald veins all, well, emeraldy. Right, go on. And apparently this scientist guy called these single-cell microorganisms emeraldites, or at least that's what he decided to name them. Clever, I mutter. About as much as the name Funny Comics for a comic book company, really. This scientist dude must not have had an overly big creative side. Not surprising for someone so left-brained, though, I guess. Also, Grover Canyon State Park is the only place this microscopic fungus exists. Like, in the entire world. It's never been found anywhere else or on any other emeralds or emerald deposits. Well, as far as anyone knows, according to the research I did on the internet after I read the files... Interesting. So the facility has internet connection? who to thunk? Although I guess it makes sense for a high-tech place. Anyway, at one point the researchers added a laboratory to the facility because they quickly realized these fungal emeralites actually have the potential for, like, super high-level healing. Like, in all living things. And basically, all top-notch pharmaceutical scientists would have to do was tinker with the little buggers a little, and they'd have the cure to all kinds of crazy diseases like we've never had before. Like what kinds? Come to think of it, this whole pharmaceutical tinkering thing sounds like the perfect job for Mom. Not that she hadn't already had the perfect job before, she, well... Oh, Mom. Just thinking about her immediately stirs up an intense achiness in my heart, and I try my best to shove it away. I still can't believe she's gone, and that she and Dad really aren't here anymore. Cancer, AIDS, diabetes, Parkinson's, pretty much everything. At the end of the day, the Emeralites would be like the ultimate pharmaceutical medicine ever invented in the history of mankind. Super E, they decided to call it. Whoa, that's insane. And extremely awesome. Definitely something Mom or her company would have loved to come up with, and now they'd never get the chance. So I'm guessing they hired Magnum Health to do that? Yep, it was the leading pharmaceutical company at the time. That is, until Mom's Farm Corps came along. This was about 20 years ago, by the way, Pete says. Whoa, so what happened to them? You know, to all the people working here. Though I'm not sure I really want to know the answer. Pete swallows hard, rubs the back of his neck. Well, that's the other thing. Based on the files, it turns out there's an extremely dangerous phase of this so-called tinkering. A phase that takes a little while to complete and in which the fungus is actually pretty much the total opposite of the greatest medicine to ever exist. Oh? I hold my breath. This can't be good, not at all. Yeah, in this particular phase, the emeralites are basically an insanely lethal and infectious disease. I mean, like, if they were to somehow break out of this lab during this phase, they'd spread and wipe out the entire world's population within just a few days. Not just that, they'd kill every single living thing, period they would just be no way to avoid it. Holy crud, that's even more insane. Now I do pop to my feet. Is that what happened down here then? Is the fungus around right now? Please tell me that's not the case. I clasp my hands to my face, my whole body tensing. It feels like my veins are about to burst. Pete puts up both his hands. Whoa, 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 calm down. I honestly don't think that's what's going on here. Huh, really? You don't think? You don't think, Pete? I'm sorry, but I don't think that's a good enough answer for me. Sandy, really, calm down. Let me explain. I remove my hands from my face and plunk back down on the sofa, 
tension drifting away from my body in bulbous knots. I guess if Pete's not overly worried, I shouldn't be either. All right, well, if the medicine's that dangerous, I'm surprised Magnum Health even decided to give creating it a try at all. He shrugs his puny shoulders. Yeah, I guess they thought it was worth the risk. Hmm, so that's why there's so much security here. Obviously not the room next door, but the fact this whole facility's underground and that special clearance is needed just to enter the actual lab itself. You know, where they must do or did the official tinkering? Pete must figure where my mind is going because he says, Believe it or not, it also explains why the police shot at us and why government helicopters tried to toast all of Grover Canyon State Park a couple of hours ago. Really? So that was all related? Holy crud, I have to admit, I did have a feeling, I just couldn't be sure. Pete nods. You see, according to emails Dr. Sarah Khan exchanged with the government, by law, Magnum Health had to keep it and the local authorities up to date with the work on the Emeralites, and it was all kept secret from the public because of how extremely hazardous the project is during that crucial phase. They didn't want to freak anyone out and cause mass pandemonium. Makes sense. So they had all kinds of special emergency protocol in place something, well, went wrong. Which I assume it did. 20 years ago anyway, right? Given all the old dead bodies lying around. Actually, I have to admit kind of interestingly, it doesn't look like that. Huh? What do you mean? Well, the Emeralites that are in that incredibly hazardous infectious phase, if you become infected yourself, they basically eat away at your body, you know? Like your skin, muscles, bones, everything. Until you die and your body's literally gone a few days later. And there's no cure, of course. They don't know how to make one yet. Oh, I let the utter horror and grossness of all that sink in. That's definitely a fungus I'd never like to come into contact with. Not that I'd like to come into contact with any fungus, really, but still. So, I say, you're basically saying there couldn't have been an emeralite outbreak down here because none of the corpses would even be here right now. Like, at all. They would have been completely eaten away until there is literally nothing left. Pete nods slowly, his eyes extra wide and intense. He rakes a hand through his overly disheveled black hair and then lets it drop back to his side. Exactly. You see, Sandy, the Emeralites didn't kill all those people. Something else did. Chapter 15 Holy crud! Well, that can't be good. Not that everybody being murdered by a killer fungus is good either, but still. Shivers roll through me, non-stop, chilling all my skin, muscles, and bones. So what was it, I ask? What killed them all? Pete stretches his neck as he adjusts his glasses slightly. Um, well, I don't know, to be honest. What? How could you not know? I thought you had a pretty good idea. He shrugs. I was just trying to be optimistic. I mean, at least we now know what didn't kill them, right? Yeah, true. Hey, do you know what? I think I know something else that didn't kill them, too. What's that? He leans forward in his seat, eyes widening. Super stretchy, multicolored gummy worms. His eyes return to normal size as he leans back. Ho, ho, you know what I mean, Sandy. No, not really. What I want to know is who or what murdered all those godforsaken people out there. Ark, seriously, why can't we just know? Pete's facial features droop as he looks down at the keyboard. Yeah, me too. But there might be no way to figure that out. Like I said... I've looked through practically all of this computer's hard drive and emails and didn't find anything, and this is obviously an extremely bizarre situation. What murdered those people? It might be... It might be something totally unique and unexpected. Gee, thanks, Pete. Real helpful. And that makes me feel so much better. Anyway, he says, when it comes to the police and all the black helicopters toasting the whole park... That must have all been part of the emergency protocol in place to stop the spread of the fungus at all costs. We, um, must have set off some kind of an alarm that mandates they do that when we first entered this place. I mean, it's the only thing that makes sense. Nothing was supposed to come or go while the scientists were creating Super E, I guess. Just to be totally on the safe side. Yeah, I guess. It does make sense. With such a potentially insanely hazardous substance down here, Magnum Health and the government had to go through the most extreme measures possible to keep it at bay and the rest of the world safe. So, he says, that's it, for now anyway. 
Oh, well, thanks for letting me know, I guess. Seriously, I'm glad he did all that research, but it was definitely not exactly what I wanted to hear. My stomach gurgles loudly, and I put a hand on it. Oh, man, I have to admit, I'm absolutely starving and parched. Yeah, I'm getting pretty hungry myself, and you know what the good news is? This facility has a room with a teleportation chamber in it that can teleport us to the closest subway. Not that I'm thrilled about stepping outside this office again since we still don't know what actually killed everyone down here, but food definitely sounds pretty darn good right about now. Pete chuckles. Such a nice and light sound after such a grim conversation. Never mind the last couple hours, either. No, I found a map of the facility on Dr. Khan's computer, and turns out there's a cafeteria nearby. And based on the layout, it's so big I wouldn't be surprised if it's got a few refrigerators and freezers, and maybe even vending machines. I'm thinking there might actually be a chance there's some food and water left over we'd actually be able to have after all these years. I can feel a huge smile spreading across my face. Awesome. Let's go check it out and get ourselves a meal, then. He climbs to his feet and gestures toward the office door. After you, sis. Chapter 16 I take the lead, leaving what feels like the small safe haven of Dr. Sarah Khan's office and going back out into the potentially dangerous hallway. Although, I hope with all my being, it's really not. Pete follows. It's right through here! He points to a door with the label, Recreation Center, directly across the hall from the office. Hmm, well that's definitely inviting. More than anything else in this facility, so far, anyway. I head over and open the door, revealing a short, well-lit hall that looks a lot like the first one but is totally free of dead bodies. Thank God for that, at least. And it's nice there's a place we don't have to turn the lights on ourselves, almost kind of like life saying, yep. Right through here, guys. Don't worry. It's totally safe. I really hope life wouldn't lie to us. We continue along the short hall and stop when we reach the end. To the right is a wall with a single door that doesn't have a label on it. Hmm. Weird. To the left stretches a much longer corridor, adjacent to the main one we just came from. The light's on there, too. Thankfully, still no corpses in sight. A pair of large, open, double doors extended along the middle of the right side of the longer hall with the word cafeteria above them. The lights seem to be on in there, too. Nice. There are two more doors on the right side of the hall towards the far end. Even from here, I can see one displays a male symbol, the other female. Ah, bathrooms. Good to know. Finally, there's a door on the very far end of the corridor. I can barely make out its label from here. Nap room, I read out loud. That door all the way down there, it says it leads to a nap room. That's sort of weird, right? Pete shrugs. Maybe it was just a place for the scientists to rest, if they got a little tired or something. I chuckle, a sound that echoes lightly in the small hall. I guess. Sounds more like a kindergarten room if you ask me, though. And it definitely would have been nice to know about when we first came down here. Okay, let's go. Pete heads toward the cafeteria. Wait. I sidle up to the door without a label to our right. What are you doing? I just want to see where this goes. My heart beats a little faster as I open the door and peer into a dark room. The light from the corridor illuminates shelves on both sides stacked with stuff like mops, buckets, and what look to be a few unused folded up hazmat suits, among other things. Ah, I say, just a utility closet. A pretty big one from the looks of it. I'm about to close the door when I spot something tiny jutting out from the wall on the right, barely visible between a vacuum cleaner and an old dusty monitor. Looks like a button of some kind. Hold on a sec. I step into the room, reach between the two items, and push the object. Yep, a button. As soon as I do, the bare metal wall at the back of the closet slides open, revealing a small chamber like the elevator we took to get down here. Whoa, I cry. I can't help it. I rush over and peer inside. It also has a single button in the interior. Yep, definitely an elevator. Wonder where this thing leads, I say. Your guess is as good as mine, Pete says from right behind me. I didn't even realize he stepped into the closet, too. Almost seems like it's a secret one or something, though. Maybe there's another whole laboratory or other kind of room even further under the rest of the facility. Although, if there is... I definitely didn't see it on the map in Dr. Khan's office. 
Oh, weird. My stomach grumbles again. Well, maybe we can check it out later. Pete agrees, so we head toward the closet door. But something else catches my attention, and I stop again. A faded black binder with dog-eared corners sits on a bottom shelf, a label running along its spine. Important files, I read. Huh? Pete stops at the door. I reach down, slide the binder out from the shelf, and open it. The first page sports a table of contents, which I quickly browse. Employee names and contact information. Check-in protocol. Lab procedures. Cafeteria and recreation center maintenance. The list goes on and on. These must be files important enough for Magnum Health to print out. Yeah, most of them sound familiar, actually. I think I saw them or even skimmed them on Dr. Sarah Khan's computer. I guess it's always a good idea to have a physical copy of important stuff, you know, in case the computers fail or the facility loses power or something. I'm about to agree when one of the contents in particular strikes me. Emergency Alarm System Protocol. I look up at Pete. Did you see that on Dr. Sarah Khan's computer? Yeah, I think so. Did you read it? His eyebrows bunch up and then he shakes his head. I don't think so, but I read some stuff in there about her emails with the government, remember? I don't think so, but I read some stuff about it in some of her other emails with the government, remember? Yeah, but you didn't read the actual file. Maybe there's more to the emergency alarm system than we think. Something important. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I think there is something important in this section that has to do with the horrible atrocity that happened down here. We should read it, like, right now. Pete's body slumps a bit as if he's disappointed we're not about to eat, then straightens. Okay, let's do it. We don't even leave the closet. We stretch out on our stomachs beside each other on the cool, spacious metal floor and fan the binder open in front of us to the emergency alarm system protocol section. Thankfully, it contains only a few pages, so it doesn't take long for us to read. We signal with a head nod to each other when we've read each page so I can flip to the next. The first couple pages are just about what happens if the power goes out or if there's a fire or something. Nothing too crazy. But then the info actually gets pretty intense. Basically, during the deadly, crucial phase of creating Super E, as soon as a single cell of the fungus breaches the laboratory door down the hall from Dr. Khan's office, the whole facility shuts down, like all the lights immediately go off and the outer door, or elevator really, locks so no one can leave. And finally, loads of little black nozzles come down from all the ceilings and spray the entire place with a highly corrosive acid for a few seconds. Yikes, I find myself saying. This part's pretty hardcore. Tell me about it. We keep reading. Apparently the acid doesn't corrode the walls, floor, and equipment since they're made of the highest caliber steel and other forms of metal and plastic, but it does completely destroy any cells of the fungus hanging around plus any human flesh, bone, and tissue it makes contact with, and it chews right through contamination suits too, so anybody in the actual lab itself can't escape it either. Oh, oh god, I say after we finish reading that part. Well, this finally explains why all the corpses are sitting and lying around as if it's just another day on the job, and it explains why their bodies are especially waxy looking. It wasn't an emeralite outbreak that killed them, but lethal acid triggered by the emergency alarm system when some of the fungus accidentally breached the lab area. I mean, that must have been what happened. Finally, finally an explanation. I'd kiss the metal floor, but that'd be so cold and gross. Pete nods, still looking down at the binder. Yeah, yeah, looks like it. That's so tragic. Although definitely better than the fungus spreading throughout the entire world, of course. Then something hits me. Wait. We didn't see a dead body near the door to the lab area, though. Well, that's the one guy lying in the middle of the hallway outside it, but... Yeah, but he's not that far from the lab. He couldn't have been the one who accidentally brought some of the fungus outside of it, and by the time the acid sprayed, he was partly down the hall, or maybe even stumbling along a bit after the acid hit him, you know, right before he died. Yeah. Yek. A sub-zero chill cuts through me like the emerald veins do the park's canyon bottoms. What an absolutely terrible way to die. I can't even imagine. Same with even just plain working down here. Knowing one little accidental breach of the lab with the fungus by me or someone else would immediately cost us all our lives. Talk about a super freaky stressful job. Pete and I look at each other and take a deep breath and finish reading the file. 
we learn that if someone does somehow survive all that crazy acid stuff and escapes in the elevator, an alarm goes off in the local police and government stations mandating they nuke the entire park to make absolutely sure the fungus doesn't spread, just like Pete and I figured. I closed the binder and we wearily climbed to our feet. It was more than mentally draining reading all that, but at least we now finally know what happened down here and that we're not in any immediate danger. That's at least enough to take the weight of this entire facility off my shoulders, anyway. Still, Pete and I need to find a way to get out of this godforsaken place safely. Then something else hits me, and the knots of tension build up in my body again. Wait, why were the lights already on in this area? You know, in the short hallway out there and the longer one by the cafeteria and in the cafeteria itself. Didn't the file say a lab breach immediately shuts off all the lights? Oh yeah, it did. So if the acid alarm system was activated 20 years ago and killed everyone, how could those lights be on? Pete grinds his teeth and scratches his chin roughly enough to leave a red mark. I don't know. That slithery feeling kicks up again, and the hair on the back of my neck prickling. You know what? Now that I think about it, the reception area was pitch dark when we first came down here, but the lights were on when we came back. And I remember now, I definitely turned them off before we left the first time. Oh yeah, that's true too. Pete stares off into outer space now like he's totally lost in La La Land, but I know he's really not. Somehow, some way, someone else has been in this lab in the last couple hours or so, and they came this way too. A horrifying thought hits me, and I flatten my free palm against the nearest cool metal wall, trying to stabilize my suddenly wobbly body. Oh no. What if... What if it's a policeman or somebody from the government? Like a super top secret agent who's been ordered to come down here and kill us. Like you said, they saw us enter the facility, and they'd have the password, right? Pete's far off look shatters. No. No, that can't be true. The emergency protocol file said nobody is to ever enter or exit this lab if the emergency alarm system is triggered, period. You know, because of how infectious and deadly the fungus is. Oh, right. Forgot about that. Well, that's another gigantic load off my mind. I remove my hand from the wall, every muscle in my body relaxing. But if it wasn't a policeman or government agent who was down here recently, then who was? It must have been somebody else from the park, Pete says, as though reading my mind. Or a visitor or camper or someone who got extremely lucky like us and got in here when the whole place was being nuked. Yeah, I guess you're right. That would be a good thing, too. Like an innocent person or a few caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, like Pete and me. But still, someone else happening to say that stupid password, Open Sesame, when they happen to be right next to the gray concrete square up there? What are the odds of that? Not very likely, but I guess it's possible. But what if, I say, what if whoever it is isn't a good person or people? What if they're like that weird, creepy couple up there who, er, uh, died? Pete's face darkens as if a shadow is creeping along it. I don't know. I mean, I guess it's possible, but they're probably just as nice and innocent as us. Plus, the weird couple might have been good people, too. Just, well, kind of creepy. Good point. Okay, let's head to the cafeteria, then. I nod my head hard as if trying to convince myself that's the right plan. I probably am. Maybe at some point we'll find whoever's in here, and together we can all think of a safe way to leave. I place the binder back on the shelf and we exit the closet, carefully closing the door behind us. We head toward the cafeteria double doors. All right, I breathe as we go. Here goes. I can't stop the flapping of little wings in my stomach. There's a chance we might be meeting our mystery visitor now, after all. I can tell Pete's a little nervous, too, since he blinks rapidly a few times, rubbing both of his elbows at the same time. I take a deep breath as we both carefully and quietly step up to the open double doors and peer inside. Chapter 17 The cafeteria is just as enormous as Pete said, stretching along the length of what looks to be the entire hall outside except for the bathrooms. Nobody's in sight, though, and I let out a little pocket of air I didn't know I'd been canning up inside. Whoever else is in this facility must have been in here earlier. But unfortunately, there are a bunch of corpses, at least one slumped at almost every metal table, and there are several rows of them. 
Some of the corpses' pale, melted-looking heads lie face down on the table tops. Others droop over the backs of their seats. Some tables even have a few dead bodies slouched at them, one with an arm wrapped around the corpse beside it, a drippy smile on both their faces, as if they were sharing an intimate moment or joke with each other, right before they died, of course. A series of chills barrels down my spine, and I fight to keep my posture straight again. Oh God, not again. All these poor, innocent people dead. Bile rises in my throat, but I do the best to shove it back down. Not exactly appetizing when you're looking to sit down and eat a meal. At least there's no nasty stench, but still. This is horrible, I say. Yeah, I know. Looks like all these people died of the emergency acid alarm system, too. And right when they were on lunch break, no less. Yeah, it looks like it. We step into the room and continue to survey it. At the far end lies a metal counter with, also like Pete figured, what looked to be a few refrigerators with freezers lining the wall behind it. A couple vending machines hug the wall on the right, too. Potted plants are placed throughout the room as well, though most of them look to be of the tropical, spiky type. Dad would have loved them. I touch the leaves of one standing by the doorway. Fake. I guess it'd have to be in order to be down here. Okay, let's make this quick. Pete strides toward the counter. As he does, a realization hits me. Grover Canyon State Park's cabin development our family was planning on staying at must have been all these scientists' living quarters while they were working on the Emeralites all those years ago. It would explain the worn, overgrown path in the woods, and the one zigzagging down to the canyon floor that is this laboratory underneath it. The scientists must have used them to get to work and back every day. And then I see something else. The cabinets above the freezers, a few of them have been flung open revealing several colorful cardboard boxes and cans of food inside. Not just that, the door of one of the three microwaves on the countertop is slightly ajar. I whip over to the appliance, passing Pete as I do, and I place a hand on top. Yep, just as I thought. It's warm. Someone's definitely been here, Pete. Like, just been here. And clearly they heated up some food. Yeah, looks like it. Maybe we shouldn't eat now. Maybe we should just go and find whoever's in this facility with us. Even though the thought ratchets up that fluttery feeling in my stomach again, I can't help but think it's a good idea. But Pete shakes his head. Nah, let's get some food and water in us. It'll give us the energy we need to explore the place. And, well, to just plain survive a bit longer down here. As though on cue, my stomach lets out another gurgle. I take it that's your official agreement? I chuckle. Yeah, I guess so. We heat up some of the canned food still in the cabinets, mostly soup and beans, and find some silverware in one of the drawers under the counter. No tooting, though, I say. Hold it in if you have to. Nothing but solid metal walls and floors and ceilings down here, remember? Pete laughs before sticking a spoonful of beans in his mouth. We're sitting in a corner of the cafeteria at one of the only tables not occupied by a ghastly corpse. It's a bit darker back here because the overhead lights don't quite reach this far, which is fine with me, especially since a corpse's head is bent over the back of a seat at the table right behind Pete, its waxen face gazing right at me. Even though it's partly cast in shadow, I try not to look at it. Still got that great sense of humor, eh? Pete asks. Even though we've been through such an unbelievably terrible time and are stuck in a cafeteria filled with dead bodies... I smile as I scoop up a spoonful of peas. What can I say? It comes naturally. Besides, I firmly believe you can find the humor in anything. I believe it. We're silent for a moment as we eat. I know you doodle on your sketch pad, he says. Huh? That came out of nowhere. What do you mean? Your sketch pad. The one you keep on your nightstand in your room. The one you're always tearing pages out of after you've drawn on them and tossing them in the trash can in your antechamber. Oh, and sometimes the living room and even kitchen garbage cans. You just figure nobody notices, don't you? I drop my spoon to the table with a light clatter. You go in my room without my permission? Uh-uh, that's like totally unacceptable. Nobody's allowed in my room or antechamber without my knowing it. Not even mom or dad. He puts his hands up in the air, one of them holding his bean-smeared spoon. Whoa, 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 calm down. Just everyone's in a blue moon. And to, I don't know, feel like you're around or something. Oh. 
I guess I can't blame him there. He and I used to spend loads of time together when we were younger, and it was super fun. But now that I've got so many friends, I don't really hang out with him very much anymore. And I only walk through your room and antechamber. That's all. I don't open any drawers or closets or anything, and I definitely don't go into your bathroom. Yeah, well, that's good. You wouldn't like what you see in there, believe me. Not really, though. I mean, it's just a bathroom. Still, even though his intentions seem pure and innocent for the most part, this is a serious breach of privacy. Pete, you really shouldn't. You're very talented, you know. Huh? What, what are you talking about? Your doodles and stuff. They're awesome. Sometimes I even pull them out of the garbage and look at them. Or even keep them in my own room for a bit. What? Really? I never would have guessed he'd do that. Had been doing that. In a billion years. This is so... weird. Though kind of flattering in a way, I guess. And it's true a couple of my art teachers over the years asked me why I didn't put more effort in their classes since I appear to have natural talent in them. I always actually tried super hard in math and science, but it never worked out all that well. Yeah, and they're funny, too. Even though you don't put any words to them, you can kind of sense the humor oozing from them. You'd make a great cartoonist, you know, or comic book artist. I wrench myself up from the table, slam my hands to my hips. Take that back. Take that back right now. That is the absolute meanest thing someone's ever said to me in my entire life. But I'm smiling as I say it. I can't help it. And before I know it, I'm straight up laughing. So is Pete. You were always too funny for your own good, he says. And you know who you got that from, right? The shadow in this part of the cafeteria seems to deepen, embracing our whole table in its dark, icy grip. I slowly sit back down. Yeah, I say, almost at a whisper. Dad. Right. So, I mean, I don't get it. You have his great sense of humor, yet you rag, er, ragged on him all the time. I scoff. Dad was a super lame -o. Just talking about Dad in the past tense stirs up that awful ache in my gut again, though. I try to shove it away again, though, without much luck. Yeah, but that's the point. He was purposefully super lame. Come on, Sandy, you know that was his sense of humor. I mean, if I know it, then you definitely do. And you know loads of people found it funny, too. I think back to my friend Carla and how she was always laughing at Dad's extremely cheesy jokes, and even, grotesquely enough, flirting with him in a way although she would never admit it, and he would never reciprocate, of course. And like Pete said, she wasn't the only one who found him funny. Lots of people did, including my other friends and, well, me. I look away from Pete toward the counter with the microwaves and hulking refrigerators behind it. Yeah, I know. So again, I don't get it. He was such an awesome, hilarious guy, and you know it. And his company's awesome, too. And he's the one who gave you that awesome sense of humor. I let out a light sigh, still focusing on the counter. Yeah, I know. Dad didn't deserve all the crud I gave him. Not a single bit, I guess. I guess at the end of the day, I didn't really appreciate him. The way he deserved to be. If I couldn't, I'd take it all back. In half a heartbeat, I really would. And now I'd never get the chance. The corners of my eyes burn, but I managed to stave off the tears. Oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. I forced myself to continue. I, I just thought Mom was much cooler than him because she started such a huge, famous company, and, you know, was obviously so loved and respected for it all over the world. But that wasn't really fair. Dad was definitely cool in his own way, too. Exactly, you know. Sometimes I wish I had your and Dad's awesome sense of humor. Then maybe I'd have more than one friend. I shift my attention back to Pete's. He's now looking down at his beans, rhythmically dipping his spoon in and out of them, his shoulders more slumped than ever. Poor guy. Pete, you do have an awesome sense of humor. Not as awesome as yours and Dad's. Well, I don't know about that, but you're definitely really funny, and you definitely recognize funny things, too. I mean, you're always laughing at Dad's and my painfully lame jokes, so you've obviously got a pretty good sense of humor. He looks back up, a weak smile spreading across his face. Look, the reason you don't have many friends is because you're such a shy, quiet guy. People don't really get to know you because you don't talk all that much. 
Honestly, I think if you just opened up your yap a bit more, you'd be surprised how many friends you'd have. His smile grows into a full-fledged one, and he scoops up a spoonful of beans. Cool. Thanks, Sandy. That means a lot to me. You got it, bro, Stink. We eat in silence again. Oh, he snaps his fingers in his free hand. I just remembered something. There's something else I found on Dr. Khan's computer I forgot to mention about. Huh? What? What is it? Seriously, how could he have forgotten something? Chapter 18 He must be able to tell I'm a little ticked off, because he says, Oh, nothing crazy, don't worry. But apparently Dr. Khan kept a journal or diary of sorts on her computer's hard drive. Really? Yep, it's obviously private. I mean, you'd have to be literally sitting right at her computer to access it. And, well... I read every single entry in it, and it's actually kind of interesting. Oh, how so? Once again, I can't get Pete to tell me information fast enough. He sticks another forkful of beans in his mouth and casually munches. Oh, for God's sake. Let's just say she really had some stuff to vent about the whole Magnum Health Super E project. Like what? Well, she claimed she was the one who figured out everything about how to turn the Emerlites into the mega-pharmaceutical drug Super E+. She did all, or at least most, of the work, which I know seems crazy with all the, er, uh, dead people lying around here, but she claims in her journal she was so much better and more productive than any of them. Wow, good for her. If she was telling the truth and not just boasting, of course. But then again... Why would she be boasting if all this was her own private diary? Yeah, and apparently she was absolutely positive that once the lab, or really she, finally finished creating Super E, the president of Magnum Health, this guy named Stephen Phillips, would wind up taking all the credit for it. Oh yeah, Stephen Phillips. I know that name. Even though Mom was my personal hero and Magnum Health was her biggest competitor, I always thought he was pretty cool too. I mean... He also owned an enormous, famous pharmaceutical company. Still, that would be seriously messed up if he would actually take credit for something he didn't do. Yeah, Pete says. She was completely convinced he was a total slime ball. knew he'd taken all the credit for loads of Magnum Health successes in the past, and that he would just do it again this time, too. Ugh. Time to knock Mr. Phillips down a few pegs in my book of heroes. Or maybe even tear his page out completely. Yeah, that'd be pretty cruddy. I guess she never found out if he did in this case, though, since they never finished the work on Super E, huh? Yeah, guess not. We finish our meal in silence and rinse off our utensils in one of the sinks along the counter. This place might be abandoned and filled with corpses, but that's still no reason to not clean up after ourselves, right? Okay, I say. Time to explore and see who else is here. At least we know it's not the creepy couple though it's still a horrific shame what happened to them. Then an idea hits me. I know. We don't have to go poking our heads out along all the doors and hallways. Even if we could, since we might not be able to access the laboratory part of the facility without special clearance anyway. Not that we'd necessarily want to, though, even though all the fungus should have been destroyed all those years ago. No way we're going to take the chance of sticking even a single cell of our bodies in there. We can just go check all the cameras from the security room. Maybe we'll see someone or something on one of those. Pete's eyes light up. That's a great idea. We take a short bathroom break using the restrooms in the corridor outside the cafeteria, then head back to the main hallway and into the security room. I flip the switch on the wall, and both the lights and rows of monitors on the other side flicker on. Let's just move these guys out of the way. I wheel one of the two black leather chairs with a corpse slouched in it off to the side of the room. I try not to look at the top of its pale, melted head, or any part of it as I do. Good idea. Pete moves the other chair, though while he does, the dead body slides out and hits the floor with a sickening thud. Oops. That's okay, it's far enough away. At least barely enough for me. We both then hunch in front of the two rows of monitors, six screens per row. Each one displays the view of an area from what must be a small bubble camera in the room's corner, and you can see every single room in the facility, including inside the lab and the pitch dark ones because of the camera's night vision. The lab actually looks pretty normal, just regular metal tables with fancy looking equipment on them, 
though a few corpses are littered throughout it. There's no sign of the fungus or anything, though, of course. Still, I'd rather steer way clear of that area just to be on the safe side. In any case, a few areas of the facility are washed in light. The reception area, the corridor off of it, Dr. Sarah Khan's office, the two hallways off the cafeteria, and the cafeteria, as expected. But there's one other room that's well lit, too, one Pete and I hadn't been to before. A digital label at the top of the monitor says, Nap Room. That's the room Pete and I saw earlier, the one at the far end of the corridor outside the cafeteria opposite the utility closet. From what I can see, there are three small enclaves in one of the room's walls. They're stacked on top of each other with just enough space for a mattress in each, like bunk beds. The room's also got three lockers, a fire extinguisher, and a small wooden desk. But those aren't the first things I notice. No way. Because it's hard to miss the two people who are also in the room. My heart thrashes around in my chest, every last drop of oxygen being sucked from my body. No way. It can't possibly be true. Though, if it is, then this has to be the greatest day of my life, because none other than Mom and Dad are in the room. Chapter 19 I have to blink a few times to make sure I'm not seeing things. Squint at the screen even though it's all right in front of me. But it's true. Mom's sitting at the wooden desk with her tall, slender figure in her stiff, gray business suit, and Dad's lying in one of the bunk beds, the one closest to the floor, still wearing his super bright pink and yellow Hawaiian shirt, fast asleep, and he's snoring loudly, as usual, because when Dad's out cold, he's out cold. But there's absolutely no denying it. Mom and Dad are really there. It's truly a miracle in every sense of the word. Oh my God, I murmur. They're, they're alive. I know, Pete says. He and I can only stare at the screen. Now that I'm really paying attention, I see there's a corpse lying in the bunk bed right above Dad. Like him, it's tucked in with a white, flimsy-looking blanket, its waxy face gazing up at its enclave ceiling, its eyes closed forever. Goosebumps pop up on my skin all over my body. I swear, every time I see one of those awful things, it's like I'm seeing one for the very first time. I turn my attention back to Mom and Dad. Mom's in the middle of sticking a forkful of what looks like macaroni and cheese into her mouth, a metal bowl full of the stuff in front of her on the desk. So she must have been the one who was just in the cafeteria and flung open all the cabinets and used the microwave. And she and Dad must have been the ones who turned on all the lights in the cafeteria, the halls outside it, and the reception area, too. Suddenly, Dad snoring stops and he leaps from the bed, casting aside the flimsy blanket as he does. We have to save them! We have to save them! He shouts over and over, his eyes bloodshot and bugging wide. He looks totally ragged, his shirt slightly torn and crinkled in places, his normally well-groomed sandy hair and mustache all spiky and unkempt. Sort of like Pete's. Mom gulps down her spoonful of macaroni and whips her head towards him. Honey, calm down. Dad paces the room, his feet making loud thuds against the metal. We have to. We just have to. What if they're alive? What if Sandy and Pete are somehow still alive and we've just been lying down here doing absolutely nothing when we could be out there searching and rescuing them, bringing them to safety? I suddenly have the urge to shout, We're alive, Mom and Dad. We're right here. We've managed to survive somehow, too, and we're in the security room. But that would be pointless, obviously. A part of me wants to burst from this room and race past the cafeteria to the nap room, but I don't, and neither does Pete. For some reason, something's telling me not to. An odd gut feeling I can't quite put a finger on, and Pete must have it too. Plus, I think I'm still not quite over the incredible shock that Mom and Dad are also still alive in the first place. I'm honestly not sure I'd be able to move a single muscle right now even if I wanted to. Honey... You know they can't be alive, Mom said in an even logical-sounding voice. Every single living thing in this park is dead by now. They have to be. I mean, we're unbelievably lucky we knew about this lab in the first place, and we were able to get here in time before we got nuked ourselves. Huh? Mom and Dad knew about this crazy place beforehand? And its emergency protocol? But how? Did they work here before or something? Dad's still pacing. He doesn't let up. Yeah, I know, but... I still just can't figure out how the local authorities were alerted. 
I mean, the only thing I can think of is a malfunction or something, because nobody else knows the facility entrance password other than the rest of the lab scientists, and, well, they're all dead, of course. Plus, when we arrived, there was no evidence anyone else is or had been down here recently. It just doesn't make any sense. Pete and I exchanged glances, his forehead all crinkled. It must be true. Mom and Dad must have been a couple of the scientists who worked down here all those years ago, at least at some point anyway. We plaster our gazes back to the nap room monitor. Dad finally stops pacing and stares hard at Mom. Our beloved daughter and son are probably dead. He grinds out in a guttural voice I've never heard him use before. And you're trying to figure out how the local authorities were alerted by the lab's stupid emergency alarm system? What in God's name is wrong with you, Linda? Yikes. Though I have to admit he does have a good point. Mom doesn't look the tiniest bit devastated or upset that Pete and I are supposedly dead, and it makes my insides both quiver horribly and threaten to shrivel up. What is wrong with her? How could she not care? Mom lowers her fork into the metal bowl. Nothing's wrong with me, David. I'm just very distraught about the loss of our children. Very, very distraught. I just deal with extremely emotional things differently than the average person. You know that. Hmm, well, that's also true. She's always so stoic, it's tough to tell what she's actually thinking or feeling. No, Dad says. This time is different. I can just tell. Well, then your instincts must be terribly off, David, because I'm heartbroken. Really. Just like you. But there's simply nothing we can do. We have to face reality and move on. Sandy and Pete are gone forever. Again, a part of me wants to bolt from the door, race to the nap room, and yell, No, we're not. We're right here, Mom and Dad. Right here. But I still can't. I'm frozen, both physically and mentally, and I still can't fight that suspicious feeling needling through me that something's seriously off here. Something that's worth waiting around to see if it reveals itself. Dad sits down on the edge of his bunk bed, claps both his hands to his face, and sobs, and just keeps sobbing. Poor Dad. We're right here, Dad. Pete and I are right here. When he finally starts to quiet down, Mom says, There's also something I need to tell you, honey. Something I probably should have told you before, maybe even a long time ago. Dad removes his hands from his face, which is all red, splotchy, and gleaming with tears, but the rest of his facial features are rigid. What is that? The reason I wanted to visit the park this summer was to sneak into the lab at one point, grab a sample of the emeralds, and bring it to one of my farm core labs after the vacation. Huh? What in God's name are you talking about? Why and how is that even possible? Yeah, that's what I'd like to know. The emeralds were all destroyed 20 years ago when the lab breach happened. At least, they were supposed to be. Mom lets out a long, weary sigh, idly playing with her suit collar with one hand. Well, you see, dear, the day before the, uh, er, uh, tragedy 20 years ago, I set aside a little sealed container of the emeralds in the lab in a secret place where I knew nobody would find them. That way, I could return around now and snag them. I figured after that amount of time, the lab would be long forgotten and off the government and local authorities' radar. Clearly, I was wrong about that, though. Dad's eyes harden as his forehead crinkles. Wait, wait. What are you saying? Are you saying you planned this whole thing? That you... Mom nods slowly. Yes, honey. As you know, we were super close to finalizing Super E., and you know Stephen Phillips was going to take all the credit for it. That's what he does. And you also know I deserve most, if not all, of the credit. Not just because I was the chief scientist, but because I was the one who practically did all the work down here. Whoa. Wait a minute. This must mean Mom is, or was, Dr. Sarah Khan. She must have changed her name after the lab breach all those years ago. But why, exactly? Well, yeah, Dad says. I agree, you deserve most of the credit, but... So I was going to sneak out of the cabin while you and the kids were asleep one of these nights and snag the sample. Then, back home, I was going to make the finishing touches to the drug at one of my labs and finally release Super E to the world, under my company's name, of course. A brief silence wafts through the room, as well as the security room, the air of which feels staler than ever. Oh, honey. Dad's eyes get all gleamy as they sink toward the ground. Then they seem to balloon out of their sockets as he whips them back up to Mom. Wait a minute. Are you basically saying you triggered the emergency alarm system? 
that it wasn't due to an accidental lab breach after all, but that you purposefully set it off all those years ago? Mom takes another deep breath, then nods again, her face as expressionless as ever. Yes, it was me. I faked being sick that fateful day and triggered the alarm remotely from the cabin. What? No, it can't be. Mom's a... a murderer? Chapter 20 R Really? Dad stutters, a sprinkle of sweat forming on his pallid forehead. R are you meaning to tell me that while I was at home looking after you, t taking care of you because I th thought you were sick, you remotely triggered the alarm system and killed all those innocent people? Mom nods slowly again. I had the trigger installed on my business laptop, which I brought home that day. Dad's gaze totally loses its focus, like he's adrift in a patch of thick, white clouds. I... I can't believe it. I'm right there with you, Dad. Mom's a cold-blooded mass murderer. There's no getting around it. Wow, my own mom. Sure, she's an amazing scientist and probably does deserve most, or even all, of the credit for the work done in this facility, but that doesn't excuse killing all those innocent people. She had absolutely no right, and obviously no moral compass whatsoever. Still doesn't, apparently. Oh my god, what in flaming heck is wrong with her? Seriously. Now my insides are roiling. So much I feel like I'm both nauseous and have a fever at the same time. Mom's not cool like I thought, not the tiniest bit, and never was. At the root of it all, she's nothing but a sick, twisted mass murderer who doesn't deserve to get away with any of this. I also had a secret backup exit installed at the back of the utility closet, she says, just on the off chance this place still was on the local authorities' radar. And well, looks like that was a good idea. The tiniest hint of a smile hovers on her lips. You know me, I never take any chances. Ah, uh, so that's what that thing is for. Which means... Mom didn't mind potentially setting off the alarm when she arrived and having the authorities nuke the entire park, including all the innocent visitors and even me, Pete, and Dad. Even if she thought it was highly unlikely that would actually happen. Oh my god, how could she? Does she not love us? Does she really not care who in the flaming heck she kills when trying to get together her oh-so-precious emeralite sample? Well, I guess not, and based on past events, too. Ugh, what a monster. What a complete and utter monster. My own mom. Dad's face mirrors how I feel, his skin almost as pale and as waxy as the corpse in the bunk bed above the one that he was just lying in. He continues to stare vacantly at Mom. Not a single muscle appearing to twitch on his entire body. So, she says, we can use that exit to slip out of here after I snag the Super E sample, just to be on the safe side. She shoves one last spoonful of macaroni in her mouth and stands. All right, let's go. But Dad plants his pot-bellied body right in front of the door. No. Mom folds her arm across her chest. What are you doing, David? Dad makes his body as rigid as the steel walls all around us and folds his own arms across his chest. I can't let you. Not after everything you've done. You're a murderer, Linda. You killed all those innocent people. And you clearly don't mind putting the lives of all the innocent people in this park and even your own very family in jeopardy, too. Even if you are the one responsible for most of the work on the Emeraldites, I'm not going to let you go and snag the sample and get away with all this. Yes, go dad! Woohoo! I want to jump up and down and root him on like a cheerleader. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Come to think of it, I think this is the only time I've ever seen him stand up to mom like this. David, move. But dad doesn't budge. No, we go straight to the utility closet and leave this place. Now. And then we go scout and see if there's any chance Sandy and Pete are still alive. His voice wavers on those last few words, but he keeps his eyes and posture firm. David, I'm getting that emeralite sample whether you cooperate or not, and I severely suggest you do. Now this is your last chance. Kindly move away from the door. But Dad still doesn't budge. I see, Mom says, practically a whisper. Well, again, you know me, David. I'm always prepared for anything. And this is one mission where I'm not going to let anything or anyone get in my way.
She reaches into the pocket of her gray business suit and pulls out a small silver handgun that glistens in the light of the room. A giant shudder bolts through my whole body. Holy crud. Dad's eyes seem to take up most of his face as he slowly raises his hands and backs up, bumping into the door behind him. Now, honey, please put the gun away. I'll listen to whatever you say. We'll grab the sample and get out of here and live happily ever after, just like you want. You'll see. Mom slowly shakes her head. I'm sorry, David, but apparently I just can't trust you, and I just can't take that chance. I've waited far too long to grab that sample and be known as the creator of the greatest medicinal drug in the history of mankind, and I must admit, at the end of the day, that's where my allegiance truly lies. But that doesn't mean we didn't have something special, David, over the course of all those years. Honey, please. I loved you, David. I really did. But now, it's all over. Mom points the pistol at him. Honey, no! A deafening crack rings out, and blood sprays from Dad's chest. No! Pete and I scream at the same time. Dad clutches his chest with both hands, blood squeezing between his fingers. Then he drops to his knees before slumping face down on the ground. He goes completely still. No! I scream again. Dad, get up! Get up now! But he doesn't. He doesn't even move a sliver. Mom stands over his limp body for a moment, gazing down at him. I'm sorry, David. I'm so sorry. She slips the pistol back into her pocket and leaves the nap room. Chapter 21 My gaze is glued to the monitor, my mind struggling to register what just happened. Mom and Dad were both alive. They were actually somehow both alive. Then Mom shot and killed Dad right in front of Pete's and my eyes. No doubt about it, she's a monster. A complete and utter monster. Was my entire life, really. And I never knew it. She... She's coming this way, Pete points at the screen that shows the hall outside the cafeteria. Mom's just passing the cafeteria's open double doors now, striding calmly, purposefully. Her face is still totally expressionless despite the fact that she thinks Pete and I are dead, and she just shot her own husband. There's a little red smear on one of her pantsuit's legs. Dad's blood. Oh God. Dad. I whip around and close the security room door as quietly as I can, then flick the switch on the wall, casting the room in pitch darkness, including the monitors. Let's wait until she goes into the laboratory, I whisper. Then go up to the utility closet and get the heck out of this godforsaken place using the backup exit. In the darkness, I can barely make out the black shape of Pete's head. Okay, he whispers back. But what are we gonna do then? I mean, after we escape. Change our names and alter our identities somehow? Mom can't ever know we're still alive and might know about what happened here. She'll find a way to kill us for sure, or at least probably will. And how are we going to survive out there? You know, in the real world, we're just kids. He brings up some great questions, ones I can't quite wrap my own head around right now either. Um, I honestly don't know, Pete. We'll think of something, though, I promise. Right now, let's just focus on getting out of here alive. His black shape for a head nods. Even though I know it's pointless, I find my gaze drifting to where I know the security monitors are on the other side of the room. Too bad the switch turns off both of them and the lights or else we'd be able to track where Mom is right now. Pete grabs my arm, and now that my eyes have adjusted to the darkness, the whites of his glow like twin moons. Shoot, I just realized something, he hisses under his breath. What? My heartbeat gives a sharp, painful stab. Mom's office. We left the door open and the lights and computer on when we went to the cafeteria. She's going to see all that and know someone's down here with her. Oh crud, he's right. I quickly and quietly crouch to the floor where the hallway light ekes under the door and peek out. But it's too late. Mom's crisp black shoes clack against the metal floor as she enters the main corridor from the recreation center's short hallway. No, we screwed up. Pete and I totally screwed up. Sure enough, her shoes pause, then quickly race over to the room next door. We've gotta go, I whisper. Now, 
We're sitting ducks if we stay here. She'll definitely check out this room next, or at least real soon. Yeah, let's go. My whole body pulsing with energy, making it feel like an electric line or something. I slowly ease the security room door open, then start tiptoeing out. Pete follows close on my heels. Aha! A voice booms in the hall when I've only made it halfway to the recreation center doorway, which is still open. Pete and I freeze in our tracks, and I swivel my head around. Mom's standing in the doorway of her old office, her hands on her hips. Sandy? Pete? There you are. Oh, my sweet children, my sweet, sweet children. I thought I'd lost you forever. Come here, my little darlings. Come say hello to your dear old mother. One of her hands starts inching ever so slowly toward her pocket holding her pistol. Run, I cry. Pete, run! Chapter 22 I bolt toward the recreation center hallway, Pete still right on my heels. A split second later, the clacks of Mom's feet as she races after us echo in the corridor, louder than mine and Pete's. I dash down the short recreation center hall, rush around the corner. There's no way Pete and I can go to the backup utility closet now. It'd take too long to call the elevator, much less get inside and make an escape. A thunderous gunshot rings out, immediately followed by a clang off the metal wall right behind Pete and me at the corner. Crud. I dash into the cafeteria and squat slightly as I rush along one of the aisles of tables, heading toward the counter, trying to stay out of view. I'm vaguely aware I don't hear any more footsteps behind me as I whip around the corner of the counter and stop, staying hunched down. I strain my ears. Still nothing. Now what? What's going on? My heart's beating so fast and hard it feels like a huge hole is going to rupture in at any second. My body not just an electric line anymore, it's an entire substation. Pure adrenaline pounding through it. This is the end for both of you now. Mom says from what sounds like the cafeteria entrance, You're sitting ducks in here. In this whole facility, really. You might as well just come out and accept your fate. There's simply no escape. Well, actually, there is. The backup exit in the utility closet. If only Pete and I can get there somehow without Mom knowing. Come to think of it, where is Pete? He's not back here with me. I also can't help but notice the silverware drawer is still partly open above me. I reach a hand up and grab whatever I can as quickly and quietly as possible. It doesn't matter what type of utensil, really, as the knives are regular, somewhat dull ones anyway, unfortunately. Not exactly sharp steak or butcher knives. But something is better than nothing, of course. I come away with a few utensils, then crawl along the side of the counter and peek around it. Mom's slowly walking down the cafeteria's main aisle now, constantly swiveling her head from side to side, gun at the ready. I can see Pete now, too. He's in the middle of the room, hunched along the side of one of the two vending machines on the left wall, out of Mom's view, but not for long. Crud. Crud, crud, crud. He's a sitting duck there. She's going to spot him in any second. She starts turning her head in his direction as she's passing the vending machine. So, being sure to stay hunched and out of sight, I heave one of the utensils to her other side. It clatters off in that direction, and she yanks her head toward it. As she does, Pete slinks out from behind the side of the vending machine and tiptoes quickly toward the double doors. Yes, he's safe, and hopefully he can make it to the backup exit and get the heck out of this godforsaken facility. Ah, behind the counter, eh? Mom croons as she swivels her head back in my direction. I should have guessed. And whoever threw that, you're a horrible shot. Must have been Pete, huh? She starts heading toward the counter faster now, the clanks of her feet mirroring her speed. Crud. She's going to be here any second, and I'll have no place to hide. Only one thing to do. I pop my head up and throw my entire handful of utensils at her as hard as I can. She leaps to the side, dodging most of them, and actually managed to block one with her gun. I duck back down as she re-aims her pistol. A deafening shot rings out, the bullet ricocheting off the side of a microwave on the counter above me. Nice try, sweetheart, but cutlery won't cut it. I scramble as fast and quietly as I can toward the opposite end of the counter as Mom's pace picks up again. 
Then I burst out from it along a row of tables. She whips her head in my direction and fires again. The bullet whips past my ear and clangs into the metal wall behind me. I squat just below a table as another shot rings out, the bullet also clanging into the wall right above and behind me. Shoot, I'm totally trapped. She's too close for me to run to the next table, and she's quickly closing the gap. I stay crouched behind the table, my mind a giant white blur. There's nowhere for me to go. Nothing I can do. It's over. It's all over. Goodbye, Sandy, Mom says. You are always my favorite. I scrunch my eyes shut and wait for the end. Chapter 23 Sandy! A loud, extremely familiar voice reverberates in the room. Get under the table! I do, barely even thinking. I scramble under as Mom crouches, still aiming the gun at me. Suddenly, some kind of liquid sprays all around us, hitting the floor, clattering against the tabletop above me. Mom lets out a blood-curdling scream as she drops her gun and claps her hands to her face. Parts of her gray suit disintegrate, leaving behind a mess of loose strands and revealing patches of withering flesh as she falls to the ground with a loud thud. The liquid stops spraying, and then it hits me. The voice, Pete's, over the PA system. He didn't go to the backup exit after all. He must have used the PA system and activated the acid nozzles from the security room. My brother the techie to the rescue. Thanks, Pete, I shout. Sure thing, Sistink. His voice echoes in the room again. Heh, <laughs> Sistink. I'll meet you at the utility closet. Okay. I shakily climb out from under the table, still processing what just happened. I'm alive. I can't believe it. Somehow, I'm still alive. But before I can fully wrap my head around that mind-numbing concept, a spark hops out of the corner of my eye, and a flame erupts on a table near the counter. I glance in the direction the spark came from. Ah, the microwave mom shot. It's still even spurting a few weaker sparks. The deadly acid that just rained from the ceiling must be at least somewhat flammable, too. The flame on the tabletop quickly grows and starts spreading along it. Oh well, not my problem. Just more motivation to get the heck out of this horrific place. I head swiftly toward the cafeteria doors, just passing Mom's limp body, when a guttural noise comes from it. I whirl around just as she finishes scrambling to her feet, barely registering she's holding a syringe with the needle penetrating her arm. She yanks it out and drops it as she lunges toward me, letting out a blood-curdling scream as she does. I throw up my arms right before both her hands wrap around my neck in a grip as steely as the walls, floor, and ceiling around us. I let out a scream of my own as she shoves me back, her hand still grasping my neck, and slams me onto the table behind me. I feverishly bat my hands and arms against the side of her head and neck. Her horribly melted, acid-burned face hovers above me, her teeth bared like a rabid animal's, her eyes totally white, no pupils at all. But nothing I do does anything, she doesn't even flinch. I also keep flailing my legs, which hit nothing but air behind her. She continues to tighten her grip, her fingers feeling like they're on fire, scorching my neck and sending ripples of pain through it. It's getting harder to breathe, but I keep fighting, keep punching, keep kicking. As I do, I can't help but notice her arms are bulging with a bunch of insanely huge muscles, way more and bigger than what seems possible. But still, nothing I do does a single thing, and her grip only continues to tighten. My eyes start to water an extremely sour taste leaking into my mouth. Then I see movement out of the corner of my eye. Pete. He's popped into view, pointing Mom's pistol at the back of her head from a few yards away. Yes, my savior. He's going to rescue me again. Goodbye, Linda Silverman, he says. I always detested you. Mom doesn't even turn her head around as a loud click rings out. No, it's empty. The Pistols Out of Bullets Chapter 24 Pete's mouth drops into a small O. Oh. Still no reaction from Mom. Then he races up to her and slams the butt of the gun against her head, as hard as he can, it looks like. Once. Twice. He's in the middle of the third swing when Mom swiftly removes one of her hands from my neck and smacks him with her whole, thick 
beastly arm without even looking. He sails backward and lands with a hard thud somewhere on the metal floor. I keep flailing and kicking and wrenching like crazy, but it still doesn't do anything. She's got inhuman strength or something now, thanks to whatever insane drug she shot herself up with. Pete, Pete, get up. Come on, get up. Mom regrips my neck with her other hand, still staring down at me with those milky, non-blinking eyes, and fire burns in my chest, one that's quickly swelling hotter by the millisecond and rising higher and higher, filling my lungs, then moving up into my throat. And Pete doesn't get up either. There's no movement or sound from him at all. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. It's the only phrase in my head now, repeating over and over, as Mom continues to strangle me, smoke billowing into the air from the growing fire in the cafeteria, flames flickering out of the corners of my eyes. And then, the fire inside me has worked its way all the way up, resting right behind my eyes, threatening to pop straight through and join the cafeteria fire. I don't have the strength to fight her anymore. I let my arms fall limply to the tabletop. Black specks start to dance in front of my vision. Now it's all over. Chapter 25 But before the black specks completely blanket my vision, there's another type of movement out of the corner of my eye. Something's coming closer. Something big and tall and brightly colored and holding something red. Only when it's close enough I can tell what it is. Dad, carrying a fire extinguisher. When he's in range of Mom and me, he winds the extinguisher back up high. Mom must realize what's happening at the last second. Maybe she even sees it in my eyes, because she whips her head in his direction, just as he plants the extinguisher right into her waxy face. She lets go of my neck and her body careens off to the side. The little black specks in front of my vision start to evaporate as I gasp for air. Same with the intense heat that had been building up inside me. But Mom doesn't totally lose balance. With another deafening, guttural scream, she hurls herself at Dad, arms outstretched, teeth still bared. I thrust my feet at her legs and manage to trip her up a bit, making her drop her arms slightly, just enough for Dad to get in another good shot right at her face with the extinguisher. This one's more like an uppercut, and her whole body arcs up through the air. She lands with a loud thud on a nearby table, flames immediately engulfing her. Her guttural scream turns into a blood-curdling screech of pain that reverberates in the room as she writhes in the pool of flames. Finally, her screech dies and her body goes limp. Dad sags slightly, letting the fire extinguisher lull a bit in his arms. He turns to me, dried blood caking the front of his Hawaiian shirt. Are you okay, honey? I gingerly roll off the table, my neck vibrating with pain. It feels as if a hot iron has just been removed from it but at least I can breathe. I'm barely aware my chest is heaving like crazy as I suck in as much air as I possibly can. Although I want to hug Dad, wrap both my arms as tightly as I can around him, and tell him that he's the best dad in the history of the universe, I say, Yeah. Now put out the fire, Dad, now. His body sags even more. Unfortunately, I can't, honey. This extinguisher's way too small to handle one of this magnitude. Now that he mentions it, the fire's raging all around us now, having spread throughout most of the cafeteria, leaving only a couple open spaces, including the one we're in, and it's only picking up pace, quickly closing the gaps, the intense heat pressing in on us from every direction. What the heck are we going to do? And where the heck is Pete? I hastily look around. There he is, lying on the ground just a few feet away, his back and head leaning against a metal column that connects to the ceiling. His eyes are closed, a huge, nasty bruise running from his forehead down alongside of his nose where Mom struck him, his glasses lying on the ground beside him. Dad and I rush over, and Dad gives him a vigorous shake as I pick up his glasses. Pete! Pete! Wake up! Dad cries. Pete's eyes roll open. Huh? What's going on? I hand him his glasses, and he puts them on his eyes immediately bulging as he jerks a bit in his seated position. Can you get up, son? Dad asks. He tries, shakily but quickly, climbing to his feet. Now what? I eye the enormous, intense blaze all around us. Follow closely behind me. Dad starts spraying the fire extinguisher in front of him, 
forming a narrow, open path through the flames that he immediately begins heading along. He lumbers as he goes, clearly badly injured from Mom's gunshot, and Pete and I follow. Yep, looks like Dad somehow managed to escape death. Twice. Although I guess you could say the same for all three of us. He continues to form a trail with the extinguisher to the cafeteria's open double doors and heads to the left along the hall, which, thankfully, the flames haven't reached yet. He throws open the utility closet door, we all head inside, and I jab the button on the wall between the vacuum cleaner and old monitor. As the far metal wall slides open again, I can tell the heat of the cafeteria fire has grown much more intense, and I glance toward it. Yeesh. It's now spread outside the cafeteria, making its way along the corridor, faster than before. We all burst into the elevator, and I stab the only button on the inner wall. But no sooner do I do that, does a horrible, deafening scream tears through the hall, through what sounds like the whole facility. Oh God, no. It can't be. The horrendous, blood-curdling scream keeps growing louder and louder, closer and closer, and then a horrifically familiar, tall, slender figure materializes amid the roaring flames, hurtling straight toward us, extremely fast, arms outstretched. The elevator door starts sliding shut. The figure bursts from the threshold of flames and into the closet, totally engulfed in them itself, mere feet away. As utterly horrified as I am, I can't believe it's Mom. My very own Mom, alit in fire and trying as hard as she came to slam into us and torch us all to death. But how did it come to this? How could someone I knew and loved and who I thought knew and loved me, Dad and Pete, do this to all of us? I can barely make out the black chasm of her open, screaming mouth right before I shut my eyes. A loud thud rings out in the cabin, and I whip my eyes open again. Just like when the black helicopter had been shooting at Pete and me, the elevator door had closed just in time. Pete's, Dad's, and my reflections all stare back at ourselves in the smooth metal door, as well as the shape of part of Mom's body engraved in it. The elevator jolts into action, only it's not going up or down, but sideways. None of us say anything, just try to breathe calmly and settle our nerves. We clearly all have trouble doing that, though, and Dad lets the fire extinguisher plunk to the floor with a light thud. Well, he says, that's one way to escape a deadly laboratory full of horribly mutilated corpses and a raging, psychotic lunatic of a woman. I can't help but let out a small chuckle. Tell me about it. Yep, Pete says. Chapter 26 What feels like an endless moment later, the elevator starts going up and then coasts to a stop shortly after that. The door slides open and we step out into a nearly pitch black area. As soon as we do, the door slides shut again and the elevator rumbles a bit as it travels back down in the direction it came from. Where, where are we? Pete asks. I can only see the black shape of his body against the rest of the darkness. No clue, I say as Dad's large, black shape says. Dunno. Wherever we are, it's cool and clammy, and although the ground is hard, it doesn't quite feel like the metal floor we just came from. An earthy, maybe even a bit moldy smell hovers in the air, too. I think we're in a cave, Dad says. Yeah, Pete says. I think you're right. This way... I start heading toward the only source of light I can make out, though it's extremely faint and I can't tell what it's coming from exactly. As we go, Pete's and Dad's footsteps behind me, my eyes adjust a bit to the dimness. Slow down a little, Dad says, his voice a bit haggard. Right. I should have known he's been having some trouble based on his sluggish, lumbering footsteps. You all right, Dad? I slow down a bit. Yeah, I think I can manage, at least for now anyway. Yeesh. Not overly promising, but at least his voice sounds stronger now, and he can keep moving. So why did Mom do all that? I ask as we round a dark red stone corner, shivering a bit as I wrap my arms around myself. It really is a little chilly. I mean, not just try to kill us all, but, you know, murder all those innocent people all those years ago. And aside from the fact that she's incredibly selfish and thinks she deserves all the credit for the work on Super E, Pete says. Right, because seriously, none of that excuses any of what she did. 
then again nothing does, no matter how hard you look at it. That's really a good question, honey, Dad says. I was just wondering it myself, and I can't help but feel like a big part of it is when she was extremely sick as a kid. When she had that rare form of skin cancer at my age, right? I ask. That's correct. She was expected to die within just a couple weeks, was even on her deathbed in the hospital. Wow. I can't even begin to imagine being like that at my age, knowing or at least thinking I was going to die. Actually, I don't think I could ever imagine that at any age. But then, this new miraculous drug was produced by one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies at the time and completely healed her. Same with everyone else who had that rare form too, of course. I can almost hear a wistful sigh in his voice. I remember her telling me that ever since that day, she was inspired to become a pharmaceutical drug scientist herself. That's great, and I mean it, but that still doesn't explain, you know. Well, Dad says, I still remember a news article that came out right after the drug did. Apparently, the medicine wound up killing loads of people during its testing phase. So many, it was hard to even get people to continue to try it out, even if they were paid a ton. And the company even considered canceling work on the crazy thing altogether. But then, the scientists finally got it right and released it. And it wound up saving loads of people's lives after that, like your mom's. Still does to this day. Oh, Pete says. I think I see what you're saying. Ever since mom was saved by that drug, she's thought some innocent people dying here or there didn't matter so much, as long as justice or the greater good was served. Exactly, Dad says. Yikes, I say. Tell me about it. Now Dad actually does let out a long, wistful-sounding sigh. You know, guys, I hate to say it and it's pretty obvious now anyway, but marrying your mother was the worst thing I ever did. Well, aside from the fact it led to you guys, of course, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. He lets out a light chuckle. But ever since I saw how little attention she always gave you guys, I just... I always felt terrible about that. You deserved, do deserve, so much more. Thanks, Dad, I say. And that's all right. You've always made up for it. Yeah, Pete says. More than made up for it. I can almost hear the smile in Dad's voice as he says, Thanks, guys. But that doesn't make it right all the same. We round another dark redstone corner and arrive at the source of light, a narrow sliver in the stone wall. I slide through, though, emerging outside. Pete and Dad go next, Dad just barely making it with his pot belly. Once my eyes adjust to the blaring late afternoon sun, I see we just came from a cave in the side of a small hill dotted with bushes. A long expanse of desert stretches opposite the hill, framed by a red rock mountain range in the near distance. The sound of cars driving by comes from above us, so we head up the hill. Dad struggles too, so I hold his hand while Pete gingerly pushes part of his back. A highway. I breathe once we've all crested the slope. And it looks like it's the one just outside Grover Canyon State Park, Dad says, wheezing slightly. No sooner does he say that does a black, dirt-smudged pickup truck pulls over to the side of the road and a man peers out the open window. He's got a long, narrow face and is wearing a white tank top and straw cowboy hat. Whoa, you fellows need any help or anything? Pete, Dad, and I glance at each other. We must look quite the sight with our torn clothes, countless bruises, and blood smears. You could say that, Dad says. There wouldn't happen to be a hospital nearby, would there? Sure is, the man says. One's just a ways down the old highway here, as a matter of fact. Want me to give y'all a lift? Yeah, that'd be great, Dad says as Pete and I say, yes, please, at the same time. All righty-o, why don't y'all hop on in? We'll be off there in a jiff. We do, Dad in the passenger seat and Pete and me in the back, and the truck eases along the road again. What in the blazes? The man murmurs, immediately slowing the truck down. What? Dad asks. Same thing I'm wondering. Flames flicker in the rearview mirror, and I jerk my head around. No way. You've got to be kidding me. 
Mom's tall, slender figure, still completely engulfed in fire, is staggering down the middle of the highway toward the truck, arms outstretched like they were in the laboratory corridor. Holy crud, how is she still alive? Seriously, what in the long, illustrious history of the pharmaceutical industry did she shoot herself up with? Keep going, Dad yells at the man. Keep going, please. Yeah, I scream. Keep driving. You have to trust us. Keep driving. Pete's yelling too, though I can't make out the words amid all the mayhem, but the truck continues to coast along, Mom slowly gaining on us. The man's eyes are bulging, his open mouth looking like it's halfway down to his seat as he keeps staring at the rearview mirror. Drive! I scream as loudly as I possibly can, and the man's shocked expression shatters as he quickly accelerates the truck, too fast for Mom. She doesn't even stagger faster to try to catch up. Maybe she can't at this point. I clutch a hand to my chest, Mom's blazing, lumbering figure shrinking as the man continues to put more distance between her and us. Finally, just before we round a bend in the road, her body sags to the ground and lies still. She's dead. She's finally dead. She has to be. I can't believe I'd ever think that about my own mom, though. As glad and relieved I am she's finally gone, I can't help a deep sadness from entrenching itself in me at the same time. I swivel my head back around and we drive along in silence for a while. I can't help but notice a band of sweat glistens on the man's forehead, his trembling hands glaring white from gripping the steering wheel so hard. Dad and Pete mop sweat from their own foreheads with the backs of their hands. That was quite something, the man says. Tell me about it, Dad says. Anyway, name's Bill O'Reilly. Who are you kind folk? We all introduce ourselves. Bill gives us a quick once over again, his hand still trembling. So if you don't mind me asking, what have y'all been up to lately? And who was that back there? Um, I say. You don't want to know, Bill, Dad says. You don't want to know. Another short silence wafts through the truck, then Bill puts up a dirt smudge hand. All right, mum's the word, I gotcha, he says as we pass the entrance to Grover Canyon State Park. Only all that's left of the place is a massive stretch of charred black bits of tree trunks and pine needles lying on the ground as far as the eye can see. Yeesh, Bill says. Wonder what happened there, eh? Must have been a heck of a forest fire, that's for sure. None of us answer. It's too depressing to think about all the people who died there over the past couple hours, including Mom, even though she technically died in the middle of the highway. Of course, I now see her in a whole different light, but still, it's not hard to feel a terrible, overwhelming tug of loss threatening to pull me into the truck's grimy, carpeted floor. You could say that again, Bill, Dad says, but please don't since we heard you the first time. I chuckle despite myself. Same with Pete and Bill. Light chuckles that break up the tension a bit. You're a silly man, David, Bill says. Very silly. I like that. Me too, Pete says. Same here, I say. Dad smiles. Thanks, guys. Hey, Dad, I say. Yes, honey? When we get home, you got any comic books I can read? His smile grows wider. I sure do, honey. He says as we pass the last of Grover Canyon State Park's ruins, officially putting them and everything that happened there behind us. So, Pete says, what do you guys think's underneath the Grand Canyon?